Um, this is the start of our priority session, start of our governance priority, start of working on this term um, and setting stuff up. And it's always, uh, always good to start with how not to get sued, or if you choose to get sued, you it's a choice as opposed to an accident. Um, and so I understand our presentation today will be starting with Mr. Saworski, is that correct? Or Mr. Woodland's going to run us through it? Okay. For approval of the agenda. Um, do we have an agenda to approve? Yep. Okay. This is the meeting. Yeah. So okay, this is the meeting of GPC, which means you need a mover but no shakers. Um, welcome everyone to the special governance and priorities committee meeting of Friday, January 20th. Uh, we have a agenda, which is council orientation, local government context, conduct of council business, and then we go into a closed meeting uh, because of legal advice. Uh, so that is our agenda. Are there any additions, deletions, or questions around the agenda? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion. Move. Move. Everybody in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Mr. Woodland. Good morning, and I apologize to whoever might view this uh, video. <coughs> the topic won't be terribly exciting, but uh, hopefully useful for uh, council members and the staff who have chosen to be here this morning. Um, my presentation is really going to focus on many of the nuts and bolts of doing local government business. Uh, later on in the presentation, Tom will provide uh, legal advice on some of those uh, aspects of municipal government where legal principles are important. Uh, between now and then, Tom will also uh, be quality control. So if I get it wrong, I'm sure he will um, correct me. Uh, the purpose today is to uh, go through a series of topics. I've provided slides to you that outline the presentation. In many cases, I will not spend a lot of time on the slide. I'll simply talk around them. In many cases, I'll speak directly to it. And I will be alternating between the screen and my notes because I can't read what I printed out <laughs> here without my glasses. Strangely. And I can't see you if I wear them. So uh, here we go. Feel free to ask questions at any time. That is our intention to try and get out of here by noon uh, when the mayor also has to leave. But uh, that's not imperative. Uh, we'll certainly spend the time to answer your questions uh, fully as we go along. So, in our Canadian system of government, there is a division of powers between the federal and provincial government. Uh, those powers are set out literally in two columns. One column falls to the federal government, one column falls to the provincial government. And within those spheres of authority, uh, there is autonomy between the federal government having its set of uh, authorities and the provincial government having its set of authorities. Those authorities over time have varied by mutual agreement. So we have revenue sharing formulas, we have federal government participating in health care by agreement, all sorts of things like that. There are also principles around the overlap of those authorities where no conflict arises. So a federal government can enter into a provincial area in some cases if it doesn't interfere with the, the provincial government's exercise of its authority and likewise, the provincial government can stray into the federal government if it doesn't conflict directly with the exercise of the federal authority. Municipalities are creatures of the province. We are created by provincial legislation. Therefore, our set of authorities arises within the provincial domain of constitutional powers. Within that context, provincial legislation is paramount to city bylaws. So while we have the authority to do things by bylaw, if our bylaw in some cases interferes with the exercise of a clear provincial authority, that bylaw can be of no effect. In the same way, our bylaws where they interfere directly with federal authority are of no effect. So it's that principle of paramountcy of the senior levels of government to city bylaws. Where our bylaws are properly enacted, and are, are founded on our authorities and where the provincial government uh, has not regulated or has authority in that area, they do have to comply with the regulations we enact by bylaw. <coughs> within the region, we have a, well within British Columbia, we have a fragmented and decentralized uh, form of local government. Um, that form of government contrasts with other provinces, such as Al Ontario and Alberta, 
where many more authorities are clustered under the local government umbrella. So the City of Toronto, for example, does more than we do. They operate uh, uh, social services, in some cases some of the health services. In Alberta, they operate things like transit under the City of Calgary and Edmonton. Uh, some of the you know, power and uh, service utilities that go beyond what we do and uh, I have a, a wider scope of authority related to social services. In British Columbia, we're very fragmented. There are many single purpose organizations. Municipalities have a discrete set of, of authorities. The regional districts have a discrete set of authorities. So municipalities are simply one form of local government. Other representative governments at this level are school districts, directly elected boards, regional districts who have uh, elected representatives on their boards appointed by the councils, and First Nations. As well, we have many local authorities in our area. We need to cooperate in many cases because these authorities have discrete uh, powers uh, that are exclusive of what we can do and they have the full authority to exercise those powers. So in our, in our region specifically, we've got School District 61, our school district, the Capital Regional District, the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations. We've got statutory agencies and government organizations like Transport Canada, who regulates activities related to the harbor and the aerodrome. We have the Provincial Capital Commission, who has authority over a number of uh, provincial lands. And of course, the province of British Columbia as a landowner itself. We've also got agencies of the provincial government, created by statute. Vancouver Island Health Authority, Victoria Transit Authority, Greater Victoria Public Library, the Police Board, and again, the PCC, all have uh, discrete authorities created by provincial legislation. In addition, we have single purpose agencies that are non profit type agencies. The Greater Victoria Harbor Authority, who regulates a number of the harbor properties and generally has a mandate to operate the harbor for economic development, is an example. Their authority, their, their ownership of property, arose through the transfer of federal assets to the Harbor Authority Society. And likewise, airport authorities have taken over most of the previously federally operated airports throughout the country. Victoria Airport is an example in our, in our region. Quick question. Does the airport authority regulate the harbor airport as well? No, it doesn't. Okay. It's discrete to uh, Victoria International Airport. But obviously, airports in any uh, urban context are important agencies that provide services for the public to travel, promote economic development, that sort of thing. We have membership uh, on two of the uh, governance agencies of the airport authority, uh, a citizen representative on the airport authority board, and a council member appointed to an advisory committee. I'm just going to flow now into the uh, specific um, uh, legislative authority that uh, municipalities have. There are two primary pieces of legislation. One is the Community Charter, the other is the Local Government Act. The Community Charter uh, was the first step, meant to be the first step in an overall overhaul of local government legislation. The Local Government Act has the vestiges of its uh, original uh, full scope of authority left in it, and I'll talk about what those are. The community charter now primarily is, uh, uh, houses most of our corporate authorities and uh, powers that arise from taxation, uh, expenditure, and um, uh, basically corporate operation. So the charter principally recognizes local government as an order of government. It specifically states that in its terms in an effort to uh, raise or elevate the profile of local government vis-a-vis -vis the province. The Charter establishes the fundamental powers and authorities that local governments, municipalities have in our province. It establishes the principles for accountability, accountability of elected officials, accountability financially to the community, uh, accountability corporately in terms of how we govern uh, our organization. 
And finally, um, the charter is meant to uh, instruct the courts to give a broad interpretation of the municipal powers for the benefit of the municipality. So in the whole, it's meant to try to give municipalities more creative ways to do things, a broader uh, set of services to provide to the community, and greater latitude in terms of how you get those outcomes, how you get those service outcomes. Yes? How did one uh, go about making changes to the community, uh, to the charter? Because so often we're at this table and we hear we can't do it because it's not within our charter, but Vancouver can. Is there an opportunity at some point to look at you know, the different charters and some things that we would really like to consider changing? Because I'm getting tired of saying we just can't do it because it says mm -hmm. somewhere we can't do it. Sure. The, um, the route to uh, seek legislative change is through the provincial government, and the vehicle for doing that is through the UBCM and the UBCM chapters, so the Association of Vancouver Island and Coastal Communities. The process to do that actually will be starting uh, next week. We will send in your agenda packages for next week's GPC meeting an overview of the process for developing resolutions to go to the UBCM. Um, the following week we'll give you an opportunity to put any ideas out that you want to explore and send to the UBCM and then we'll be trying to get all that uh, dealt with before the end of the month which is the dead or the end of February which is the deadline to get the resolutions to the Association of Vancouver Island and Coastal Communities conference in April the process is I think uh, one way to put it is if you uh, identify something that's a significant issue for the council, uh, we develop a resolution, we send it on to the ABICC uh, conference. If they endorse it, it goes to UBCM and typically would we'll be getting onto their agenda. Um, if something arises between uh, basically March and June, it misses the conference, the chapter conference, but it can go directly to UBCM. And again, there's a process for doing that. So, like many things in this organization, there are lots of issues that uh, need to be dealt with through legislative change. It is a matter of focusing some time and, and thought on those types of things and developing a, a report or a resolution that can be supported by the council and supported by other councils uh, at the, uh, either the UBCM convention or the ABICC meeting. And Rob, is the, would it be the same strategy if we were looking for changes to the City of Victoria Charter versus the Community Charter? No, not so much. Um, I mean, the Victoria <coughs> City Acts, there's a number of Victoria City Acts, they're very old, uh, and they really are founded on uh, principles that you wouldn't necessarily want to hang your hat on today. So they allow us to discriminate in some cases on how we do things. Um, the Charter obviously says when you're doing things, you need to, to ascribe to different principles. So for example, uh, under the Victoria City Act, we can be very discriminatory with our business licensing. Under the Community Charter, we have to be more open and equitable. So we have to charge fees that reflect costs. We have to provide uh, 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 hearings for businesses where they're affected by regulation uh, and other sort of procedural type things that uh, uh, make sure that businesses can't be discriminated against. So there's two different themes there. Um, it would be the same process, but I don't think the province would entertain amendments to the Victoria City Act at this point in time. And they haven't in the past, so for us the strategy would be looking for things that would be province-wide basically in terms of the impact. And the community charter is the province-wide legislation as well as the local government act that governs most of the municipal activities. So that would be the, the focus for, for legislative change. Um, when we met with you, Ben, Shelley, and I, we asked for a copy of um, the community charter. I know that's a cumbersome um, activity, but is there a way to get at least a copy for back there so we can all have a look at it or a yes. couple copies? It's all on the net. It's easy to do. Yeah, I want a printed copy, though, we and I think it's cheaper to do it through the print shop instead of print printed out of that computer. That's what you said, right? Um, we, we, we promised we would get you a copy. Okay. Uh, I just wonder if anyone else around the table wants access, especially since Charlotte raised the idea of potentially one in the Yeah, we'll put uh, we'll put a local government act and a community charter on the reference table, and then I'll make sure you understand how you can connect onto um, one of the uh, uh, locations where you can find it online. Yes. 
It's an interesting point Charlene brings up, and, and Pam asked the question. I don't think when we did the heritage revitalization, the tax exemption, the 10-year tax exemption, we didn't go through UBCM for that, did we? Um, I, you know, I don't know the answer to that, but I know this answer. Now, with the charter, uh, doing a program like the tax incentive program is much simpler mm -hmm. because there's a broad revitalization authority for tax exemptions in the charter that enables a scheme like the tax incentive program to be brought into, uh, into play um, quite easily. I, mean, I, mean, I think you've outlined the easiest of the processes. We want to make provincial change that you look for groups to work with at the municipal level and, and push it through UBCM and ABICC in the first instance. But there may be some one-offs that we actually need to think through that's a more strategic stealth thing, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Any other questions just on that? I'm just going to move into sort of some of the specifics about the Charter, a number of different areas that I want to talk about. The first being municipal powers and purposes. So one of the things the Charter <coughs> does is convey or confirm on a municipal corporation that it has natural person powers. Uh, examples of that are the ability to enter into contracts and agreements, like a person can, uh, buy and sell property, uh, and that sort of thing. There's a whole host of other natural person powers uh, that flow out of that. Um, those are the types of things we're talking about. So it enables municipalities to make flexible arrangements with different things, different organizations, different people, and to operate in many senses like a natural person. What the Charter also does, though, is provide for a whole bunch of different processes that a normal natural person wouldn't have to go through to do that. So processes around notifying the public, transparency, accountability, uh, are added on to this natural person power ability. We also have the ability to determine what services the municipality deems to be a municipal service. So you conventionally think of municipal services like things like water, sewer, paving roads, providing police and fire services, the traditional types of services. But certainly it doesn't preclude the council from determining that um, affordable housing, for example, is a municipal service. Caution in sort of entering into that type of um, uh, arrangement is, is can the municipality uh, afford to go down that road? Does it have the type of taxation authority it needs to fund that type of activity? Obviously the provincial and federal governments relying on corporate and personal income tax have, a, have deeper pockets and a more equitable means to redistribute uh, income throughout uh, society uh, by regressive taxation and redistributing it down through different types of social services like welfare, uh, income assistance, employment insurance, and affordable housing programs. Unfortunately, they decided to get out a lot of that stuff and have left <laughs> the problem on the doorstep of municipalities. So municipal services are what the municipality can deem to be a valid municipal service, and then you can enter into arrangements to support that municipal service. The Charter also creates 15 general spheres of authority through which the city can regulate, prohibit, or impose requirements. In other words, require somebody to do certain things in order to be able to uh, lawfully uh, exercise a right on property, for example. Construction standards are, are, are a good example. Our exclusive regulatory authorities where we can regulate, prohibit, or impose requirements are in relation to municipal services, public places, animals, trees, signs and advertising, fireworks and explosives, firearms and weapons, cemeteries, protection of persons and property, nuisances, public health, protection of the natural environment, buildings and structures, soil removal and deposit, and business. There's some qualifications to some of these because some of these authorities are shared with the provincial government. In the areas of public health, protection of the natural environment, building structures, standards, and prohibition of soil removal deposit, we have concurrent jurisdiction with the provincial government. What that means is when we want to regulate in those particular areas, we have to seek provincial approval 
typically from the minister responsible for that area, to ensure that our regulations don't conflict with whether, whatever provincial, provincial legislation and regulations are in effect at the provincial level. An example for that is in the area of building structures and standards. We can't impose building construction standards that are greater or interfere with the provincial building code. We can do things that might supplement, modify, but not interfere with the, the, the fundamental things that have to be achieved through the BC building code. Councilor Young? Uh, just on the specific one of soil removal and deposit, uh, can you give the Give me the reference to where the provincial legislation is, and also, in the absence of any of any regulation by us, which I take it is the case, do their regulations apply? Um, Tom might have to help me out on this one a bit, but as I understand soil removal and deposit, it's in many cases related to uh, large-scale aggregate removal or the assembly of large-scale aggregates on sites within the municipality. And I don't know how the provincial uh, legislation interfaces with that particular activity. And I must confess, I'm not uh, familiar with what the provincial rules are or what the legislation is. I, I can certainly find out uh, in that vice council. Uh, it, certainly, provincial rules, whatever they are, uh, would apply uh, to, to uh, city power in the city. We certainly have a power, although as far as I know, we have not exercised it to enact rules regarding soil uh, removal and deposit. Um, so, so does that mean the provincial regulations apply, or that they do not apply, or do they fill in where we have failed to regulate? Uh, they, uh, well, the provincial rules uh, apply. Uh, but I'm not sure that there are any provincial rules. Uh, I'm not sure what rules we're talking no, about. Oh, I mean, they may not be relevant. A, oh, okay. okay. I mean, to, to operate a, a gravel removal plant, oh, there are okay. certain provincial requirements for that. Okay. Uh, and, and, and they would apply if, if that was in the city of Victoria. In terms of talking about uh, a bylaw that we could enact uh, regulating uh, deposit of soil or removal of soil uh, from land within the city, um, that would be separate. That's a separate power from, from the provincial power, and so we have the power to do that. Okay. I okay. suspect some of the concern okay. in this area would arise from provincial mining regulation and aggregate uh, regulations, because the province, uh, as the uh, crown, uh, holds the underlying uh, ownership of the minerals and the oil, gas that are that is under the subsurface. And they, I would assume, are have a vested interest to ensure that those things are kept within their realm and that a municipality couldn't prohibit someone from exercising its mining rights or oil or gas drilling rights within the municipality. But I, I'm pretty sure it also pertains to the aggregates as well, because obviously excavating uh, you know, millions of mi mi cubic meters of uh, gravel um, uh, is an is a issue for a municipality, but also uh, a strategic issue for the province in terms of aggregates available for uh, different purposes like highways and cement production and things like that. Um, we are able to enter into spheres to address our local needs. So I think Councillor Young is referring to uh, soil removal as it pertains to land development. Uh, that's a concern in many uh, communities. So at the small level, regulations around can you come into a lot dump, you know, a thousand cubic meters of gravel and soil to raise the height of the land so you have a great view over your neighbor's house of the ocean. Um, those would be the types of regulations that would be of concern to the municipality because that's one of our fundamental things that we do is regulate land development. Uh, could we enact uh, things to uh, prohibit mining? We may not because that's a provincial uh, domain. So these things are exercised typically in relation to local needs. Entering into those areas <coughs> might entail costs and liability. We have to be careful, we have to do good analysis before we enter into areas that might interfere with the province, that might take us into areas of broader social concern. 
and of course we must not interfere with the senior government authority. However, uh, a few years ago there was a decision coming out of Quebec that said a, a municipality can enter into a provincial area of, of authority and provided our municipal regulations don't prevent a person or an organization from meeting the provincial legislation, they can be in place. And so the example at that time was the municipal uh, herbicide regulations in relation to um, uh, prohibiting uh, certain types of herbicides from cosmetic use for lawns, uh, gardens, and things like that. There's also what are called ancillary powers, and these are really many of the filling in the between the lines on our fundamental powers to regulate prohibit and impose requirements. So the types of ancillary powers we're talking about are the abilities to establish conditions and variations and require licenses and permits. That's most obviously uh, exercised in the context of business licensing, where you do have the ability to do all sorts of things with business licensing, provided that in the end you don't end up prohibiting business. We can enter onto property to inspect and take action when a party defaults on an order of the municipality, uh, most commonly rela in relation to building construction or nuisances created on property. Our bylaw officers are frequently working with our uh, building permit officials on these types of cases. We have the ability to, to uh, enter into intermunicipal regulatory schemes and or services. <coughs> we want to partner with another municipality to provide garbage collection, we could do that. If we wanted to get into a, a single business license common across the entire municipality, we've started a, a little bit of that process. But there are some impacts when you start to move into a single business licensing scheme, one of the obvious things you have to figure out is uh, how is the revenue attributed to which municipality, who's going to be the regulator, those types of questions. We can discontinue providing a municipal service where someone doesn't meet the conditions uh, of, uh, of uh, taking that service on. Most commonly, if you don't pay your water bill, we will cut your water off at some point. And we have the ability to exercise extraordinary powers in an emergency, to do things that we wouldn't otherwise ha uh, be able to do. And some of those uh, uh, obvious emergency powers also come out of the Emergency Management, I think it's the Emergency Management Act in BC, where we have the ability to do a bunch of things extraordinary uh, to our municipal powers when there's an emergency, including declaring a state of emergency and acquiring property for the purposes of evading an emergency condition. <coughs> So we generally have greater discretion in how our powers are exercised under the charter regime. But again, it requires more work to get there. The Local Government Act used to be very prescriptive, setting out the various steps and authorities in a very fine level of detail. Now with these more general powers, we need to ensure that we create policies, procedures, bylaws to govern how <coughs> we are going to do these things that we are enabled under the community charter. Again, with some of these generalized powers come limits. And I'm going to talk about a series of talk, topics that wouldn't be obvious to the regulatory powers or to the natural person powers. <coughs> so municipalities can provide assistance, typically to persons and organizations, and generally not towards business except in specific circumstances. What are some of those circumstances? It's a good question. I'm going to answer that. Oh, good. Sorry, I'm not even reading ahead. See, I'm so fixated on what you're saying. <laughs> Business assistance can be provided. You're, me you're mesmerized. You are. Svengali. <laughs> uh, business assistance can be provided under a partnering agreement to provide a municipal service. So at our municipality, we have a partnering agreement with the Save on Foods uh, Memorial Center operator, RG Properties. Uh, we have continued to say that providing a hockey arena, an ice skating facility, is a municipal service. The benefit that we provided under the partnering agreement is an exemption from property tax payments. 
So that was one of the uh, trade-offs we uh, made when we uh, set up the Save on Foods Memorial Centre. We can also provide assistance to business for the purposes of acquiring, conserving and developing heritage properties. We've done that through the Planning Department's Tax Incentive Program for Heritage Redevelopment in the downtown heritage areas. And we also have the ability through revitalization agreements to encourage redevelopment of land. So we have an authority to grant tax exemptions to businesses in a specific area uh, defined as a revitalization area. But it's an area, not a specific business within it. We'd have to say like this block or this 18 blocks, businesses within it. We couldn't say we're only going to give it to child property. I think uh, legally you might be able to do that, politically whether that's a good idea is another thing. So I think you're right, the principle should be if all of the Rock Bay area was for whatever reason desired to be redeveloped for different purposes than it is now, you might offer incentives in terms of a uh, exemption from a portion of the payment of taxes to those people who reinvest in the land <coughs> and build new buildings for new purposes. And that is exactly what this program is meant to do. Take an area that is uh, uh, in, in transition or is run down and provide an incentive for uh, property owners to reinvest in those lands towards what the council sees as the new vision for that area. So we, so we can do an individual is more of a political question than a legal question. Interesting. Yeah. I'll ask that one. Tom's one. nodding. Okay. Yeah, that, that, that's correct. I mean, there has to be a designation of an area uh, which would be a general in nature, uh, the, the area that requires revitalization. Uh, mm. But then the actual agreements where the benefit is being, uh, or the assistance being uh, provided, would be with, or could be with individual business. Um, businesses, I think where there might be difficulty, it would be if council were to designate it as an area that requires revitalization, a single parcel, and then offer the property owner some assistance. That, right. that would be difficult. Or legal? Legally difficult. Yeah. Ah, okay, so that was uh, actually good. Yes, I remember we were looking at individually on uh, affordable housing, can we give <coughs> 10 years tax related to There's a legitimate basis for designating an area, and it doesn't have to be a, an entire neighborhood. It could just be several, uh, a block or two blocks mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, uh, of area that require revitalization. You can then provide assistance to an individual business so within that area. The area Correct. And then have general agreements and anybody can take you up on that. Yeah, you, you said that you, you establish a program with set standards and an agreement that they have to enter into and when they satisfy that agreement they get the benefit. Typically that's a tax exemption certificate um, and we've done that with the um, Dockside Green uh, power plant that uses the green energy source. So they have they enjoy a revitalization tax exemption uh, for the purposes of operating that green uh, power and heat facility. Okay, thank you, Chris. Is it a geographic area only, or can it be a sector? I know the BIA legislation normally it's a it's an, a geographic area, but it could be a sector. So Sydney could set it up on books, for example, bookstores. Could we do that for high tech? I don't know. I think, it, I think it has to apply to property, physical, geographic area, uh, because what it's meant to do is have an incentive for the transformation of land from a derelict use to a use that the council has identified as a community priority. I was thinking about how to get around this stuff. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, one of the things I remember when we talked to Langford, it was, or Langford was part of the agreement on what's rural and what's not rural, Langford said, okay, um, you know, our development area is the boundaries of Langford. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how they, they're, you know, they're, they're out of it. So could you actually say, okay, our redevelopment area is the boundaries of Victoria, right? So that way everybody within it, you can do that, but. I'm not sure if I'm sure you could justify that. Uh, okay, so. Yeah. Yes, in theory, it could be an area that covers the entire city. Yeah, related question. Um, so if general prohibition again, prohibition against providing assistance to business. But what if, for example, we wanted to get rid of all of the Burger King 7-Elevens and McDonald's 
downtown, or at least to prohibit the future setting up of such places. Um, is there a way to provide a tax incentive to building owners who are going to lease or rent to small local startups for a period uh, of, say, five years while the business is starting up, and then we uh, property? It, does that fall within? So in spite of the specific authority we get from the Community Charter and the Local Government Act, uh, we, all the other laws of Canada and British Columbia apply to us. So. That's a complicated question, whether you could do that and not get sued under NAFTA or some other free trade agreement, uh, a federal or provincial business regulation power. Um, uh, generally speaking, and Tom, this is where I asked Tom to help me out, you, you can't use your zoning authority to prohibit in most cases. Well, that's what Esquimalt's doing right now with the cash shops, or at least what they're proposing to do. I think I suspect the, the, the businesses they wish to regulate have maybe written to them and yeah. okay, so them well, I'll leave this question for another time, but what I want to know is what are the levers that we have for stimulating the setup and support of small local businesses downtown specifically and in neighborhoods? I think a lot of that is provincial. If you look at some of the provincial, I remember in Manitoba they wanted the film industry, so they have specific credits for development of the film industry in Mammon. Like most of those kinds of things are provincial in nature. Right. So it would require working with the province. But there's also a federal aspect too. It's going back federal to one of Tom's earlier, or one of um, Rob's earlier comments. The paramountcy of the federal government as it introduces acts like CETA, mm -hmm. when that's finally approved, your question, the answer to your question will be no, we can't, because it will be prohibited under those, specifically prohibited under that type of legislation. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm, we're talking about the prohibition on business. And I know the mayor mentioned earlier something about affordable housing. So where the, where the beneficiary is a, is a person or an organization, such as a nonprofit, your assistance, your ability to provide assistance is uh, less fettered. Rob, is the local area improvement project idea captured in this, or is that separate? like Broad Street and Yates Street when it's 50-50 with the property owners, that kind of arrangement? Hmm. Um, that may that may fall under under, that under this yeah. one. I mean, this the, uh, Councillor uh, Madoff is talking about specified area improvements. I'd have to go back and look at the, the wording of that, but certainly cost sharing mm -hmm. for a municipal improvement like Broad Street, which is the sidewalk treatments, the lighting, uh, the general amenities of Broad Street um, were done on a 50-50 cost-sharing basis with the ratepayers, um, and the and the legislation specifically authorized that at the time. Um, so I think that may be this is an addition to to that that ability, but the same consistent sort of theme. So partnering rather than yeah. providing the system. and in that particular case, well, uh, the businesses benefit from the improved streetscape. So do the general residents of the city in the sense that they have an improved public environment. And is it 50-50 with those businesses? Property owners. Property owners, uh, property owners. Okay. Yeah. yeah. The fronting property owners fronting is how it's done. Okay. Typically. So the types of assistance that municipalities can provide is exempt in payment from the municipal ta property taxes through different programs. Uh, the tax incentive program for heritage <coughs> is an example in our community. Um, However, we also exempt property tax payments from a variety of social service organizations who are located in the city of Victoria, and we do that through an annual tax exemption bylaws, permissive tax exemption bylaws. <coughs> we can dispose municipal land at less than farm fair market value. An example of that is the Ella Street Shelter. The disposition in that case was a long-term lease at a dollar or ten dollars a year, something like that. So we did provide. Uh, assistance for the purpose of providing that shelter and supportive housing. Uh, we can provide a financial grant, a benefit, and an advantage. We can loan money, but our director of finance strongly rec <laughs> recommends against it. And we can guarantee or provide security for borrowing, which sort of touches on the issues that we're looking at with the uh, Travelers Inn properties that the city has required. Uh, the grant that we want to receive from CMHC is in the form of a mortgage. We need to guarantee that we will repay it if it's not operated as a uh, social housing service. And that's sort of a form of assistance in terms of that, that arrangement. I think 
one more quick question. Is there a, a prohibition against to whom we can lend money, even though Brenda recommends against it? Um, you, to be honest with you, Councillor, I have not uh, waded into that particular area. And while the Charter says you can do provide assistance to persons and organizations, I don't know what the finer level of detail is around the persons <coughs> category. Didn't they have that in Colwood where they just sort of borrowed 20 bucks out of the till for a while? And well, in, in Langford, they do provide, a, they, they do specifically provide financial assistance to persons because they have a uh, affordable housing program that targets single family residential units mm -hmm. that a person enjoys a benefit of, a, of, I think it's a subsidized purchase price or something like that. As a loan? No, as a, as a, a one time benefit right, to someone. Right, I'm talking about lending specifically. Yeah, no, I don't. We're not, we won't cut into that business. <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> Lisa's cash and go. No, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. You have to go through Brenda. <laughs> I, I just will ask Brenda on that piece of paper here. She'll say no. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Before she gives you the specifics, she'll start with no. Uh, shifting gears, uh, literally. Um, the city owns the land within our highway rights of ways. So all of the land underneath municipal roads and rights of way uh, is in the is in the ownership of the city. Um, it's not in a in a um, condition that would be immediately saleable. We have to go through a number of steps to create a parcel that is a fee simple interest in property. So a highway right of way is a unique interest in property. It's for the benefit of the public. The public has the right to pass and repass over that property. We can only interfere with that right by going through a process of closing the highway and notifying the public and providing opportunities for people to speak. And once we go through that process and close the highway by bylaw, we can raise title to the property and then it's in a fee simple status and it can be sold, subdivided, combined with other adjacent properties, things like that. Councilor Young? How do you distinguish between a highway and a park? Is the Chandler Gonzalez pathway a highway? It's a highway. Does it have uh, to, be, to carry vehicles to be a highway? Or I is it I well, it doesn't have to be a roadway to be a highway. So my understanding of that situation is it's a lane, mm -hmm. but it has the same status as a highway. It is a public right of way. And the comment that was made last night that perhaps proper process was not followed to close it in the first instance is a good one uh, because there are formal processes you have to go through to exclude the public from their right of way. Go ahead. Uh, so, well, if somebody says a highway, I think, you know, highway one, highway five, whatever. Um, so you're saying highway is any road, any lane, any right of way? Where Anything. it's municipal, because you have to be careful. We register rights of way over top of public property, but that doesn't give the same ownership right to that particular right of way. So when a developer creates a large, say they do a large development parcel and we want a pathway through the middle of it for the public benefit, we can register a right of way over that, but it doesn't accrue this ownership interest. So, so I mean, the question I get on this one then is, to a certain extent, we have all the roads, highways in Victoria, but um, Douglas Street, I mean, I think there's a section from Mayfair to Uptown that's it's Saanich, there. but then the province owns the rest, like, to a certain extent. There are some fine grains, and, and specifically, uh, provincial highways, federal highways are excluded from this, even though they might transit through a municipality. Uh, the city of Duncan, I could assure you, definitely doesn't own <laughs> highway number one. Um, the question as to whether what we know is Highway 1 and 17 through our municipality is Douglas and Blanchard Street. Whether we own the underlying uh, uh, title in that roadway is uh, not a question I can answer. Because it is this, is it a provincial road? They say it ends from a maintenance obligation point yeah. of view, but I suspect that they would argue strongly that from an ownership point of view it is a provincial or a federal highway. But Tom, Tom would have to research that particular question to answer. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to sort of answer this in, in general, the, the question of what is a highway or which highways do we own. Uh, as a general proposition, 
highway includes any public right of way that is not located on private property. So that includes, and it doesn't have to be a vehicular right of way. So uh, uh, pathways uh, fall within, and lanes fall within a definition of highway. Uh, how highways are created, uh, there's a number of, of ways in which historically they can, they can or have been created. Um, and uh, uh, most commonly through either a dedication or uh, reservation at the time of subdivision. Um, certainly in, in Victoria, when the, the, the first city plans were laid out, they, they indicated certain streets and roads, and those would all be highways. Um, and s subsequently, any subdivision plans would have been reserved for highway purposes. But they can also be added through dedication or purchase. So it, it, for any specific uh, uh, parcel or, 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 or lane, we would have to do the research and find out how exactly what its history is, how it was created. As Rob pointed out, uh, rights of way that the city may register, which allow the public to, to uh, pass uh, over private property, are not highways. Mm -hmm. So they remain private property. I think it was actually Jeff and then Lisa. Well, I, I was just going to uh, say the courts have said, for example, that people are allowed to, to camp in our parks, but presumably not on our highways. So it becomes important what they are. So can you just recap it once again? You, you just talked about it, the process which that we have to go through if we're going to turn a highway into a parcel of land. See, I, I, I'll, I'm happy to talk about that because um, <laughs> this is what I want to do, but nobody's interested. Well, we're doing it already with the Reliance development, right? Uh, yes, it's a good example. Um, the process is we need to uh, close the road. So whatever it is, a path, a, a defunct lane is a, a good example. So an old, years ago, many areas of the city had laneways put in the back. And the city, for all intents and purposes, has abandoned many of those as functional municipal uh, lanes. And property owners have assumed uh, occupancy of them for parking their vehicles, placing sheds, and things like that. So. Um, in spite of the fact that someone occupies it, if it's still a city highway, uh, we would have to uh, formally close it up by bylaw. So we would uh, craft a bylaw, we would bring it to council, you would give it readings, we would then notify the public of your intention to close this highway. Um, the public has an opportunity to make submissions regarding that particular uh, proposition. Uh, council considers those submissions and then considers adoption of the bylaw. And if you adopt the bylaw, then you have formally closed the highway. Um, then you're in a position to apply to the land title office to raise title to those lands so it becomes a fee simple parcel. And once you have the fee simple interest in this new land that you've created, you can sell it, you can subdivide it, you can exchange it just like another piece of property. But with the reliance piece, we already agreed to sell that thing that's not yet a piece of land, and so we can't, the public hearing is by de facto, doesn't matter what the public says, we have to do it. Yeah, the obligation again is notice, is to provide notice. Whether you do close it in the end, that is a, a bylaw, that's part of your legislative discretion. So whenever you adopt a bylaw, you have legislative discretion, just like the zoning bylaw, you have legislative discretion, whether you enact that or not. Um, so you can, I, you know, I would argue also as well, it does give us a better ability to regulate activities on highways to some extent. It's limited though because you can't uh, exclude people from uh, the highway unless you change its nature into something else, namely a, a fee simple interest in the problem. Yes? Uh, following up on the third point, Closing up and selling surplus rights away, I'd asked Rob some questions relating to that pertaining to the Chandler pathway as part of a future discussion. So I'm, I'm interested to hear the, the uh, answers to that. Yeah. But my question was more about the first one, regulating activities on the highways. Does that mean that we could uh, name a portion of a highway and ask someone to pay for the right to have their name on it? Um. Like a naming right for a building? I've never thought about it in that context, so I don't think I can answer you. What what I what I am thinking about is, 
is, for example, this will come to you because uh, one of the things we want uh, to try and resolve are some issues around uh, vehicles for hire using uh, public rights of way to operate uh, tours and things. From. Uh, we may have to, um, to enable a, a scheme of doing that, may have to close this as uh, close the area that they want to park and occupy in officially uh, from being a highway leave it as a highway just as it is now and then license its use because what we're doing is we're saying okay public you can't park here no one can park here no one can occupy this area unless they are this person to do that we've got to go through this process in a small small way and this will actually be talked about in the next couple of weeks as we bring our vehicles for hire uh, paper to you about uh, commercial two operators horse-drawn carriages and things like that so you you don't because you uh, change it from being a highway into a fee simple parcel doesn't mean you have to rip up the roadway and would that then have an impact on the um subdivision with panhandles when it's predicated on the highway definition so if we made a change like that would that regulation implementation I change couldn't answer that question um so it's yeah. worthwhile that we're thinking of that to be mindful that there would be a ripple effect yes sir i'm sorry i do understand what you're saying um yes because subdivision requirements require access to a highway and if change the parcel then you may have done something inadvertently to a property owner and alienated And it's the highway definition that yeah. specifies what the frontage has to be on the highway? Yep. Like there's some yep. That's something situation. you do have yeah. to consider. So uh, the, reason I, the reason I mention this one is at some point in time it may be in the municipality's interest to look uh, at a systematic basis as to surplus or defunct highways. Uh, for the purpose of generating uh, capital for other uh, projects that the city might require uh, and or to promote development in areas where land is underutilized for whatever reason. Do you think we could, I mean, I understand a little about the bylaw use, but could you, would it apply to, for example, say you wanted to say, now this is way too far, right? Only electric vehicles, so it's open to people, but only electric vehicles are allowed to run on this road or um, <laughs> only vehicles that you, meet, you know, but you think about all the, I mean, the provincial government got out of the regulation of all the big buses, so you can say only vehicles that meet these standards, i.e., you don't get to spew public all, all this stuff out. So it's a way to regulate that way. Uh, you know, the types of vehicles yeah. that you have to use, the, uh, the standards yeah. of vehicles, to fix some of those problems that you may want to. Mm -hmm. This is complicated. Uh, this is a, a tricky area in the sense that uh, yes, uh, council has the power to regulate traffic. And you certainly have the power uh, to regulate or, or restrict the use of roads to certain types of traffic, uh, but it's more would have to be distinct. The distinctions would have to be based on the traffic impact rather than. I'm not sure that method of propulsion hmm. in terms of whether it's an electric engine hmm. versus diesel versus uh, gasoline or something else uh, would be an appropriate way of regulating traffic because we have that there is an interaction here in addition to our ability to regulate highways in activities on highways in general traffic regulations have to also be consistent with the with or are limited um, uh, by the motor vehicle act provisions which is provincial legislation um, so I, i'm not sure that i can answer this question definitively right now but i, I think that there would be uh, a, there is some ability to regulate for example the size of vehicles I'm not sure if method of propulsion would, would be a, a basis for it. Yeah, so you know, sticky bus is bad. Yeah. Yeah. Clean bus is good. Um, right? Well, that isn't, that, that actually, to, uh, if I could answer that, that might be one of the things we try to look at in the context of this commercial use of public space for vehicles for hire. Mm -hmm. certainly, um, but you could do that through other means. So, yeah, for example, uh, if we wanted to promote uh, zero emission vehicles like pedicabs and, and uh, Rickshaw. rickshaws, well, we could simply uh, not have a restriction on the number of licenses. So you wouldn't have to go to the extent of dealing with this authority to accomplish another objective. You may simply lower the barriers for those firms to operate that type of business, expand the area that they can be in, the regulation powers and that sort of thing. But Hope Bay, Victoria.
Victoria and Esquimalt allow neighborhood zero emission emission vehicles in ZEVs. Saanich doesn't. How does that occur? They stopped in ZEVs. They wouldn't validate them. What's it's related to the speed. Line? Neighborhood zero emission vehicles okay. called NZs. I think it's related to the, the speed that the vehicles are capable yeah. of traveling. Is that Peter? Is that, that the issue? Yeah. issue? It's the uh, design of the vehicle and, it's, uh, and the speeds in terms of an impact and, the, uh, and how the vehicle would perform in, under those circumstances, which regulates what speeds they should be traveling on. And that's how we've allowed that to, to occur on a specific corridor within our city. But we've allowed it. How did Saanich deny it? Is it the same it's issue? It's, a, it's upon the uh, municipality to decide whether it's appropriate or not to have that type of vehicle within their use on their on their highway. I mean, my opinion is um, Certainly, there are more large, fast roads in Sandwich than there are in Oak Bay. So, Mackenzie Avenue, big thoroughfare, traffic's moving fast. You know, you put the 30k electric cars on. Me and my truck, and so but you may not want to. But what about segways? I mean, yeah, that's yeah. I mean, part of what we've heard is segways are not allowed on highways. Or so those are issues that relate to holes in the provincial legislation, yeah. as I understand it. So, anyways, I do wish to move on from yeah. this topic. Lawyers <laughs> love holes. <laughs> Lawyers here all day. I know it's all top of mind from last night. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I will yeah, carry on. Uh, business regulations. So our powers there are limited. There's no general authority to prohibit businesses. However, you may regulate and impose conditions on businesses, so they have to achieve certain standards or certain things in order to operate in the municipality. When we change regulations that affect businesses through business regulation authority, so when we rely on our specific power to regulate business uh, under the Charter, we have to provide notice to those businesses and give them an opportunity to provide feedback to us before you adopt the regulations by bylaw that affect them. Typically, we do that through an opportunity to send a written submission or to appear before council and speak to the matter before you adopt changes to business bylaws. A good example would be our pet store. Pet stores, yep. Yeah, in, in the context of the animal control regulations, we applied regulations for pet stores on sale of animals, and so we needed to uh, provide opportunities for them to uh, address council. Remedial actions are something that the municipality routinely gets involved in. In our context, this typically flows first through the private property maintenance uh, bylaw. And at this point in time, the Planning and Land Use Standing Committee is the committee that uh, conducts a hearing into these remedial actions and notices on titles, and then either directs or make recommendations to council regarding the remedial actions. So we have the authority to order someone to remedy their property, to abate the nuisance, to abate the hazardous condition on the property. There's a bunch of fine grain uh, things that are set out in the legislation, but generally it's related to hazardous conditions and nuisances. The person who is ordered to do something has the right to request reconsideration, to appear before the whole council and say, you shouldn't do this to me. And we conduct a hearing in accordance with our hearing procedures. But most often they appear first here at the Private Property Maintenance Committee, typically on a notice to put a, a notice on the land title uh, relating to a illegal construction or use contrary to the city's zoning bylaw. Next we're going to talk about the themes of public participation and council accountability. So the Charter um, basically establish three ways, three, three statutory vehicles that uh, councils can use to seek uh, elector input. Two of them are formal and binding. These are the alternative approval process and referendum. A referendum most recently conducted for the Johnson Street Bridge in 2010. Just a year ago. That flowed out of an alternative approval process that the electors successfully raised to prevent the council from adopting the bylaw to authorize the bridge without going to referendum. So 
Alternative approval processes are often used in cases where the expense of conducting a referendum is disproportionate to the uh, amount of borrowing that you're proposing or the size <coughs> of the capital project. So if we were wanting to borrow $2 million for more than five years for a fire station improvement, and we've done that in the past, um, it doesn't make sense to spend $200,000 to have a referendum. You're better off to go through the alternative approval process. Other projects, so uh, looking back into the past, the uh, arena project, a large project, uh, $30 million. Uh, differences of opinion in the community as to a value around a hockey arena. Uh, that was deemed to be uh, a project that should go to referendum and we did that and the voters uh, successfully approved the arrangements for the Save on Foods Memorial Centre. Opinion polling is also seen as a legitimate form of elector input. So using other uh, various types of scientific polling to inform council decision making is also recognized uh, in the Charter as a legitimate public input method. So Rob, with the solid waste, the engagement that we've had mm -hmm. there, Council has suggested that that input is going to be binding, but it's not technically binding, it's at the discretion of Council? Correct. And where does public engagement and the public engagement strategy and all of that fit into there? Is it just not mentioned in the Charter and that's something that we've created? These are the these are the formal processes that someone like me in a municipality administers as an election Got official. Okay. Whatever the council and the administration do to inform the public as to the uh, 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 point of view that you'd like the public to support is, is at your discretion. This is typically, right. typically when you go through one of these things, the council's addressed its mind to the value of whatever question you're putting to the public and typically takes a stance to say, uh, you know, we believe we need to borrow these two, this $2 million to fix the fire hall. And you would go out publicly and say, please support, or in, in the case of an alternative approval process, don't oppose this bylaw because this is a valuable uh, improvement to the uh, life safety of the fire hall. Right, so we did a pretty engagement, or a pretty detailed engagement um, around the OCP and there's that's not mandatory. That's there's no nowhere in the community charter does it say you must have this really extensive engagement process. That's that is in many respects discretionary. What is mandatory is that you conduct a public hearing before yep. you adopt the changes. So this is the, the I guess you could look at this uh, councillor helps as the minimum minimum requirements. So Rob, just picking up on that with respect to the plan, so there is a provision for early and participation which hasn't necessarily been defined what exactly that is so the, it, the OCPs are a bit special in that regard closed meetings open meetings we're in open meeting the chart are the charter and the council bylaw, because the council bylaw is built upon the authorities in the charter. Uh, both specify the circumstances under which you can close a meeting. Those circumstances are set out in section 12.3 and 12.4 of your council bylaw. Everyone has been provided with an updated councillor handbook, and the council bylaw is there in tab 6. There's a host of reasons, but the distinction I was just wanting to make today is under Section 12.3, there are a host of reasons that are discretionary. So the council may close the meeting to the public based upon one of the sections outlined in Section 12.3. Typically, staff prepares reports, will present to you a recommendation in the report to close the meeting and the grounds under which the meeting should be closed. You can consider that and accept that recommendation or not. When we go through that process individually with each report, you just need to be mindful that the report may have been written from a perspective of including information <coughs> that we should not 
despite the fact that you want to discuss this matter, that that particular report should not immediately be thrown into the open meeting because there may be consequences for the release of some of that information. So just be mindful of that and that staff in writing a report under a closed section <clears throat> might include information that we would not want released publicly. It might be the resume of someone who has submitted an appointment uh, application to the city. Uh, it might be other personal information. It might be legal advice. It might be any one of these things specified in 12.3 that we provided m a, a more detail than we might otherwise if it was to be in a public report. And just need to be mindful of that. And you address your minds at the start of the meeting as to whether those, all of those topics on your agenda should be in the closed meeting. <coughs> Councillor Helps? Yeah, so if we wanted to come up with some direction for staff about what should generally be in closed session and what should generally be in open session, would it be useful to have some kind of policy around the our, this council's interpretation of particularly section 12.3? Um, I, I certainly wouldn't see any uh, harm in that. It would set an expectation for the administration to understand where council's at in terms of what they want to routinely see in an open meeting versus what they were are, are prepared to support as a closed meeting item. Because um, then, then you wouldn't have to write reports twice, right? Then you, if, if we directed that you know and it, something was always going to be open, then the reports would reflect that, and it wouldn't make extra work for staff. No, if. If council is uh, sensitive about the closed meetings and making sure they uh, are being as transparent as possible, supplementing what's in there with some policy direction would, uh, would potentially be helpful. Yeah. Contrast that with section 12.4, which are sections that require us to close the meeting. There's no discretion. And typically those relate to negotiations with the federal government, the provincial government, and a third party in relation to something that's being worked out by the senior levels of government with local government. Uh, federal and provincial levels of government for, uh, enjoy far more ability to conduct their business in uh, private uh, than local government does. The third party uh, issue, is, is it between senior levels of government and a third party, or is it and or a third party? Um, I believe it's both. Okay. I didn't know you had to have that magic of having a third party. Yeah. Involved. And then, of course, there's, there's um, uh, provincial government agencies, there's federal government agencies, and that sort of stuff. Right. So it's, it has to be considered in each individual case. Thanks. So when we act as a quasi-judicial body, we're sometimes in open. So private property maintenance is in open. Mm -hmm. Chief's permit hearings are closed. And, and the Under, question is, do we want to? And yeah, that's yeah. exactly. And and with our solicitor joining us, that's one of the questions uh, he's asked. As in Vancouver, I believe Tom, you commented that those hearings are held in an open meeting. Um, we had routinely kept them in the closed meeting because often the discussion is around um, criminal offenses or a criminal background or charges pending on someone uh, that you know um, we've chosen to conduct in a closed meeting. That's not to say that it couldn't. Yeah, 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 interests of uh, privacy interests of, of, of the parties but as a general proposition the council bylaw reflects council policy on open and closed meetings so insofar as a direction to staff the bylaw is the direction to staff and so if we wanted to change the direction we'd have to write a policy you could amend the bylaw in fact I would suggest that that would be the most appropriate way of doing it if, if that's what oh, okay. council wish to do would be to amend the bylaw but even in court, they don't discuss previous convictions and charges mm -hmm. that haven't been proven, do they? Mm -hmm. That's the kind of thing that I'll let you can't get into. Uh, brought forward, forward by the police and these things. I think there's, there's pros, and, pros and cons for doing it either way. Yeah, and it's really a choice. 
without sort of getting too deep into this, there, there is a possibility of, of holding the Kranpil in uh, public with the possibility if there is a particular type of information that is going to be discussed, uh, having portions of it heard in, in camera. Probably just to Potential. Another element of uh, transparency for municipal government is the annual municipal report, uh, which must be published by June 30th of, of each year. It must contain the audited annual financial statements of the municipality, a list of the exempted properties, properties exempted from the payment of taxes. It must also include an overall statement about municipal services and operations, the statement of objectives and results, and a future statement about objectives and measures. Um, we've been working over the years uh, to improve the comprehensiveness of the annual municipal report. I think with Gail joining us, there's a much more uh, focused effort in terms of reporting back to you on uh, performance related to our objectives, uh, developing better measurements of our uh, outcomes and that sort of thing, and then any other information you want to include in the annual report. And typically there's a public meeting convened um, to present the public report. Uh, we usually use a GPC as an opportunity to release the annual municipal report. Um, it was originally conceived something like the shareholders meeting of a, of a private corporation. Uh, municipalities do it in different ways according to the, the um, objectives of the councils. Conflict of interest provisions are set out in the community charter and they are also reflected in your council bylaw in appendix one. I'm not going to get into the fine level of detail, although Tom will talk about some issues related to conflict of interest later on. But generally speaking, these provisions set out a number of things. So our, these provisions define two types of conflict, pecuniary conflicts and non-pecuniary conflicts. Pecuniary conflicts relate to a financial gain or loss arising from an interest. Direct typically means that financial gain or loss accrues to you personally. Indirect might mean it accrues to your household, through a spouse, uh, through a relative who lives with you, like a child, perhaps a father, father-in-law, that sort of thing. Non-pecuniary conflicts, I think you can really sort of think of as biases. So your ability to make an objective de uh, decision is influenced by a personal relationship with someone, um, typically your best friend, and your ability to sort of separate that relationship from <coughs> the matter at hand can't be done. The Charter sets out exceptions from conflict of interest. So there is a section in the bylaw, section 104, that identifies specifically things that aren't a conflict. An example of that is you're not in conflict if it is a matter that generally affects everyone in a community or an area of the community. So a specified area improvement isn't necessarily a conflict. Taxation isn't a conflict. And even setting your own salary and benefits. It's not a conflict for the council members to participate in that particular discussion. When you have a conflict, you must declare the type of conflict and give reasons. So for instance, uh, if it's a non-pecuniary conflict because it's my next door neighbor, I won't use that one, That's, that one crosses both ways. Uh, it's your best friend who's applying for uh, rezoning of a property. Then you might say, I've got a non-pecuniary conflict of interest in this matter. Uh, the applicant is my best friend and I'm excusing myself for that reason. Um, other conflicts arise in a pecuniary sense if, for example, you owned a piece of property, a neighboring property immediately adjacent is being upzoned. Presumably you will either benefit financially or lose financially from the approval of that rezoning. You may have a pecuniary conflict arising from your ownership in the property you would excuse yourself, state the reasons, and then, once you've done that, 
You must not participate in the discussion and voting of the matter. You must not influence your colleagues or staff, colleagues being your fellow council members. You must not influence outside persons or outside bodies in relation to the matter. And Rob, with the, uh, the one that always comes up for me um, is the indirect pecuniary conflict with property in Chinatown, right? And so it doesn't matter how much or how... It, it, well, as I always like yeah. to say, conflict of interest is always different air, shades of gray. And the blackest is when you own the parcel right next door to the one that's being rezoned yeah. and, you know, that's fairly black. Yeah. Uh, the instances that you've communicated to us are further over towards yeah. the gray and the legislation sort of says as you approach the point where it's almost insignificant, you may not have a conflict at all. Where, where is that line? I, I can't tell you, you need to get advice yourself. And unfortunately that's part of the onus of the, of the community charter is you have to get that advice personally because the conflict is your personal interest with your duty as a counselor. There are instances where you may have conflicts that arise because uh, you're appointed to the uh, Harbor Authority and the Harbor Authority is an applicant for a rezoning. You may come to us at that point and say, are my roles conflicted? And we would, we would be able to uh, provide some guidance in that respect. But where it's a personal interest, the onus is on yourself to seek that advice to make sure you don't come. So with that in mind, if uh, you're a CRD rep on the housing corporation, and the housing corporation is um, purchasing property in Victoria and building something. Do we excuse ourselves? And we haven't in the past. I, I think, if I may, uh, the situations where a council member is uh, appointed to another body, uh, whether it is uh, CRD or whether it's ex officio as, as the mayor, as the chair of the police board, those are not conflicts of interest. So a council member who is on another body appointed by council or is uh, appointed by virtue of a provincial statute, uh, that's, uh, uh, that's been, the courts have held that clearly legislation uh, creating that kind of dual uh, role could not be creating, could not be uh, interpreted to create a conflict of interest. So, for example, there is no conflict in uh, the mayor participating in policing matters uh, in discussion at city council or in discussing at the police board uh, context uh, matters to do with the city of Victoria. So, just to be clear, uh, all these bodies that we're appointed to uh, are, will tell us your duty is to act in the best interests of this body, whether it's the PCC or whatever. So there could be a situation where um, I'm sitting on the PCC or the harbor or whatever, and I vote in favor of a rezoning, which is good for the PCC or the harbor authority, but then I come here as a council member and listen to the planning staff and say, uh, no, that's not a good rezoning, or yes, it is a good one, uh, uh, and I and I can I, I'm allowed to have that sort of um, dual approach to the issue, looking at it from two different points of view. Uh, I'm not sure that I would accept uh, the proposition that. Uh, your first obligation uh, is to look after the interests of a particular body. Okay. It very much depends on the, circ on the circumstances of your appointment. A number of appointments of uh, council members to outside bodies are as representatives of council or as representatives of the city of Victoria, and I would suggest that you continue to be a representative of the city of Victoria and not necessarily uh, owe a duty or, or some somehow a higher duty to the body that you're sitting on as a director any more than you I, 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 I should refer you to, I, 
<laughs> I'm I just have come the, the briefing us. binder for the other body yeah. in there, and, yeah. and I'll bring it in, and you can discuss it with their lawyer, because there's clearly a difference of view yeah. on that subject. Yeah. <laughs> and and I, I understand, but, but this is, you know, and very much will depend on uh, how the, what the role or how the position is created. So in instances like the CRD, where the legislation specifically contemplates that there will be councillors uh, members of council from the city of Victoria, uh, as a certain number appointed to the CRD, you are there as a city councillor. On the other hand, bodies which uh, do not require that the person uh, uh, who's there is a city councillor, but you are appointed by the city, that may be a different situation. So that's that's specifically why I use the instance of a non government agency to which we're pointing. Harbor Authority is one of those situations that's trickier because it's a not-for-profit society. We don't necessarily have to appoint a council member to it. We could appoint a lay person. However, uh, CRD, PCC is an example. And there was litigation related to the PCC years ago and the court ruled there that the province must have contemplated that there would be uh, conflicts between a city councillor's role on a council and the provincial capital commission board member and despite that he fully intended them to participate fully in those both activities and they can make the decision at the PCC board and then sit in judgment of a zoning application that the PCC brings to the city and the councillor is not in conflict so it is very much in relation to how that appointment arises so all I, the, the message I just wanted to leave with you today was if in relation to those appointments to another body you feel you might be in conflict with your role as a counselor, that may be an area where we can provide advice to you. You don't have to go seek advice like you would if it was a personal interest that conflicts with your role as a counselor. That's the only point I was just wanting to make there. and then. Vast shades of gray. Mm -hmm. It's very useful information, and, and maybe it could be the subject of, of more discussion. It's almost you need a, you know, a playing card in your wallet when you're on one of these committees where you hold up the rules, because yeah. certainly on the PCC and uh, the Harbor Authority, the suggestion is is that by the nature of our role on council, we're in conflict. And both those organizations have had discussions about whether they should actually change their governance model to remove counselors. Mm -hmm. And it's not one that's resolved. It's, it's ongoing. And I, it, it makes for a lot of discomfort and puts us in a defensive position where it would be useful if there was some kind of definitive statement that we could make beyond having to go in the past, the legal route, to defend our position on those bodies as well. So maybe it's something we can park slightly, but I can see it, you know, as uh, both the PCC and the I GDG. Tom, are you volunteering to do a session on this? Yeah, yeah. Just on the back of a joke. Oh, you're a good man, Tom. Thank you. <laughs> uh, it's certainly something that I, that I can uh, uh, look into it and provide an answer. Because it's in, almost... In your, in, your your handbooks, it's in your handbooks, there is a piece uh, from a Vancouver firm around conflict that's quite good. Have mm -hmm. a look at that if you haven't. And um, it might answer some of your questions. But in many cases, it's each circumstance presents a slightly different case. And well, what might be useful is at the appropriate time is communicating that to those bodies rather than us having to defend ourselves at the time so that they have an understanding of what our view is of the, of the situation as well. So maybe that's the only difficulty is that uh, it's the, the, the answer very much may be different for different bodies because mm -hmm. it very much depends on the governing legislation, its structure, the form of the appointment. Uh, even the fact of whether the appointment uh, uh, or the uh, legislation requires that a, uh, a city appointee be uh, a council member or well, not. Well, there's that chance. That, that is a, a potentially a, a, a very significant... Uh, but the two bodies where it comes up most consistently, unless I'm missing something, is the PCC and the GBHA. Yeah. So maybe that's where it would be useful at the appropriate time to have a sense of trying to put that issue to rest, which is probably impossible, but at least it would put us in a more defensible position. But
sorry. Well, I was going to say, I mean, the interesting areas is, is mayors sitting as chairs of police boards. So there's yeah. some, some interesting, oh, and it's almost like the, the legislation anticipates that you're in conflict and allows it. Yeah. Uh, but the second piece is, which we should probably, and I'm not sure if it's a legal discussion, well, it's probably a legal discussion, but it's also a governance discussion, is, um, well, I mean, a good example would be uh, we appoint people to the uh, Labor Relations Board. Um, oh, right. And originally, the discussion was sort of like, they're appointed, we can't really influence how they vote there. Uh, and it was only through a lot of practice that we went, well, wait a minute, if council wanted to, yeah. we could pass a direction saying, we direct our two representatives to vote this way. Settle. We don't agree with what you're saying there, or that sort of thing. So uh, that understanding about what role we are as a liaison, are we there, and then once we're on that board, we're independent, although we're kind of reflective of what council mm -hmm. is, or does council give direction back. I mean, a good one, for example, would be uh, municipal appointees. Is, you know, is the responsibility for the municipal appointee for the police board to, to come here and take direction for us? Or do we just put them on there, yeah. and then their loyalties, liabilities is directly to the police board and not to us? But then the question is, what's the value of having a municipal appointee? If, mm -hmm. and those are sort of the, the interesting. So we should probably have some legal opinion on it, but we should also, just as a a governance issue, how do we have expect to govern ourselves mm -hmm. and what's our expectations of our appointees? It would be a good way to uh, well, probably deal with it now instead of conflicts as they come up. And not just smaller groups like TDLRA as an example, but CRD. We, have, we may wish, council may wish to give direction to our CRD reps. I mean, I mean that's, that's an interesting scenario. I don't think we've ever done that. And to Jeff's point about... That, that was the intent of the legislation originally, and we yeah. moved away from that in yeah. a very yeah. explicit way. Yeah. which has pluses and minuses. And to Jeff's point about voting one way at one table and a different way, a contrary way at council table, that's not dissimilar um, from voting one way at a GPC meeting and when it goes, uh, moving it to public hearing and voting the contrary way at the public hearing. Well, I, I see that. It, it, well, it, it's but anyway, I mean, it's yeah. just a situation we deal with. Yeah. Right it's, a, it's, a, it's a big topic. Let's yeah, ballpark that, but I think in the governance discussion uh, that will be going on for the next couple of weeks and stuff, that is one I think that will help us avoid conflict in the future and have clarity of expectations. So the overall objective of the conflict rules is not to uh, force elected officials to abandon their private interests, but simply to make them transparent to the public in the decision-making processes. There are consequences. Or sorry. Sorry, can I just ask one more quick question about that? The last thing you said. So, if you don't have a conflict, like you sought legal advice, you don't have a conflict, but the public perceives, knowing what they might know about your work outside of council, that you do have a conflict. Do you say, "I don't have a conflict"? Like, do you declare, or is that just you just be quiet and? Well, that's a political issue, really. Um, uh, there's a formal process that you go through if if you excuse yourself because something comes before you. Uh, you're sitting there at the table and you're looking at this report and you go, oh, am I in conflict on this? <laughs> it's my and so, and so you excuse yourself and then you go away and you realize that you were wrong or as time passes, you go from being in conflict to not being in conflict because your contract with an organization has expired you are no longer an employee of that business, you know, whatever the reason. So there's a couple. So you can get back into the discussion if you've excused yourself by going and seeking advice from a lawyer mm -hmm. who would say, well, no, Lisa, you were wrong, or no, Lisa, you that contract's over, you're good, you should be able to participate now, whatever the circumstance might be. If you get that advice, you can come back to the table and say, I've, I've received advice, I'm not in conflict, I'm rejoining this, the table on this Yes. Uh, and is there not also an added element, and it, it may be a question for Tom and tell me if this is more in camera than not, but that you seek that advice and, and you rely on that advice. And if in the future, for some reason, someone challenges you and you are found to actually be in conflict, um, but that to a, is to a certain extent a defense uh, against, you, against the, the, the finer grain of that is probably best dealt with uh, in the closed meeting, but I can I can say this: despite the fact of whether you declare a conflict or you don't, if you are in conflict, you have committed an offense. So, 
by virtue of not telling people you have a conflict, if you have one, doesn't absolve you from the consequences that the act puts on to you as a result of being in conflict. And what the, just to take the So if it is found that you were in fact in conflict, participated through a process where you were in conflict, but we didn't find out about it until a year afterwards, the consequences, the penalties may apply even though you didn't identify the conflict. Even though you not. relied on expert advice? Yeah, Pardon? well, because the lawyer that I saw oh, said... Now, if you did have legal advice, yeah. then of course, yes, you would say, I sought legal advice, because at that point, you are exercising your duties in good faith. You've right. done what the yeah. Act has asked you to yeah. do, you've sought that advice, you've received it, you've participated in good faith, and you've done your due diligence. The, the lawyer that I saw said, though, that one of the reasons that sometimes, even with legal advice, conflicts, people can be... Um, found liable or whatever, is that they didn't give all of the information to the lawyer to whom they sought advice from. So that's... And that's the fine... Yeah. yeah. yeah well, really, are you the sure fine. you tell me everything yeah, you need exactly. to know? Yeah, exactly. So I just told them everything. Counselor, got you. Really <laughs> <laughs> but what Lisa was saying earlier, the political decision is whether the public perceives you to be in a conflict, even though you were given legal advice, but that's just <coughs> whether they believe you'll get real, you know, with that information out there, they have their right at the polls to check your name or not, even if you are given the legal advice that you're not in conflict, it's ultimately a political decision as what the public deems it the to be. The consequences, politically, the consequences being an actual conflict and perceived conflict yeah, is may a, is be the same. Decision. Maybe it's the same. The public could perceive someone to be in conflict, yeah. even though the lawyer says they're not. But, I mean, in a, in a, but if you're not in an actual conflict, but the public perceives you as one, if you're not in an actual conflict, the consequences under the Act do not flow to right. you. Right. But However, well, like you say, you not, yeah, right, in the ballot day, box, right, that's so another... That's a political decision you have to make as being yeah. on council, whether mm -hmm. you yep. decide to participate on your political future or not. But at the same time, the Act says you participate fully in the decisions of the mm -hmm. council, you're expected to be at the table you know, so you have to weigh those things, those Absolutely. obligations to be an active participant at the council table versus the fact that people will always perceive a decision of council one way or the other and may lay more emphasis on the position you took than someone else. And the bias one, which would be interesting to Tom, but it's sort of like, as someone said, uh, just because you're supposed to be open, you know, there's a difference between a, um, uh, an open mind and an empty mind. You don't have to have an empty mind, but you're allowed to have opinions. You just have to be open to change. Mm -hmm. So additionally, conflict provisions also include things around prohibit, prohibiting you from accepting gifts and benefits from people or organizations, unless it's a consequences of protocol or your official duties. And there are some policy documents in the handbook that relate to that. I'm not going to dwell on that. If you uh, receive gifts valued at greater than $250 in the year, you are supposed to report that. And there's some guidance in the, in the, the handbook for you on that particular aspect. Councilor Young? I actually would like to dwell on number one a bit because we, we've had advice from uh, Tom during the last council, which I had some difficulty with. And, I, and um, it's this exception as part of uh, protocol duty or social obligations. And I think t Tom's advice was very um, narrow in terms of in terms of what that exception was, and I read his advice as meaning um, I think it was only accepting um, obligations that were imposed uh, by council. Uh, so if you were required to go to the community meeting, you could have a cup of coffee at the community meeting. But if you were invited to the opening of Janice Place or Belfry. the Belfry or you went to, um, well, we get five a week of invitations to community meetings or uh, openings and um, the normal, uh, well, the um, meeting that ha happens on Tuesday mornings at our place, the uh, once a month, the, um, what, what do you call that? Community? 
Yeah. The, the neighborhood community? No, the um, the meeting for when the um, our place discussed yeah, we just got draw, draws in the neighborhood. Yeah, and, and, and I believe I've gone there and I think they have a coffee, a oh, cup of coffee. And but I wasn't told to go there by council, so it wasn't an official council duty. And uh, the question is, is that does that fall within the protocol exception or not? And I and I know we discussed this back and forth, but I. I, I sort of had meant to follow up on it a bit more because it's fairly consequential in terms of uh, how much coffee you drink. Uh, yeah, <laughs> hundred cups. Hundred cups. You're done. I even eat the matzo. I think that uh, this is a very uh, uh, difficult uh, area for a number of reasons, and, and I think my previous advice, uh, which was perhaps <coughs> a little bit uh, more narrow than. than uh, uh, I, I've construed that uh, phrase in the community charter as matters incidental to, to uh, protocol and, and uh, duty more narrowly, perhaps. Um, and it may very well be um, that it uh, depends on what is uh, the uh, normal uh, uh, role of a city councilor or, or the interaction. What are the sort of incidental matters to the role of the city councilor? Um, the uh, I'm sorry, let me just find the uh, section of the gifts. Uh, so the discussion the actually point. started with the discussion of entertainment events mm -hmm. and tickets. Mm -hmm. And I know that, and, and it really comes down to what are what are the social obligations associated with the position. Mm -hmm. um, not being a city councillor, not being a politician, I've perhaps taken a view, perhaps more narrowly, of, of uh, viewing it from the lens of a, of a staff person, a public employee. Um, but I would caution you that if you are being invited to an event simply because you are a city councillor, rather than because you're active in a community, and I'm not sure how easy it is to make distinction, um, then uh, uh, you may be uh, in a situation where you are being offered gifts or, or, or benefits. Um, and I think the question that we were dealing with uh, last year was specifically an offer of, of uh, tickets to, to a play. Um, if this is being done simply because you are a city councillor and there is no other uh, function or event happening at which you're representing the city or acting in an official capacity in some sense, that could be construed as accepting a benefit. And I would not, I'm not sure that I would see it as uh, being incidental to some social obligation. On the other hand, if you are attending a meeting uh, of a neighborhood uh, uh, association and you accept a, a cup of coffee or a cookie, I don't think that that's uh, that would fall within something that's incidental to the social obligation. You're in a meeting, and that's simply part of the social obligations. Okay. Having said that, as uh, Rob said earlier, this is something that the, uh, the like uh, conflict of uh, interest, these are matters that are, uh, the burden is on you individually to decide it, and it's really a matter, consequences are to you individually, uh, potentially disqualification, uh, and it is something that really uh, you should be seeking independent legal advice on. So, for example, we all, I also own a business. So when our business donates to something, and as a result of that donation gets two free tickets to something, or, or sponsors, I just sponsor, we just sponsor something, and they just emailed me yesterday with, you get two free tickets, do you want them as a result of your sponsorship? I accepted those tickets. But now when I go, should I not go as a counselor? Do I, 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 I like remove my tag and just go as a, and, and yeah. even though I am? I, I would suggest that in that situation, firstly, the tickets are not being offered as a gift connected with the performance of your uh, right. office. No, they're not, so but it could be perceived. That does not, that does not uh, trigger the uh, provisions in the uh, community charter, uh, but I would suggest out of abundance of caution, uh, in that kind of situation, I would emphasize the connection as a donor 
rather than as a council. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, and, and, and again, the provisions aren't meant to disconnect you from your private life, to, from your private interests. It's simply meant to say where those private interests intersect with the public's right. business, you make them transparent. So, so do I need to make it transparent? I wouldn't go to the I wouldn't go to the event Just with your name yeah, badge on. Yeah. yeah. Simple answer, I think, is right. common sense to what you were thinking. Right. Yeah. Where the name tag says Shelley Fifth Street, it doesn't say Shelley City of Victoria. It's a yeah. difference. I don't have Fifth Street, but. <laughs> Councilor no, Thornton. Um, in the past, my understanding was, say for example, we're invited, uh, given free tickets to the Bell. My understanding was if I was acting mayor and they wanted you to come yeah. and present or something. open yeah. or something, then that is fine. Um, and especially if everyone else that was going was a paid, was paying tickets. However, if I was just given as a counselor because we're one of the we're sponsors of the Belfry, uh, you couldn't accept it because everybody else is paying. However, if I'm invited to uh, the Victoria Foundation annual open house, mm -hmm. which is free to everyone, and, and to show our support, you could go um, and attend because no one else was, is, a paid, is, is paying to go there. And wear your name badge. And wear my name badge because I am, uh, you know, because it's an open house and no one else is paying. That was my understanding. That's usually how I was somewhat. But, but according to you, you're saying. We shouldn't even be attending to the open houses at, you know, United Way or Victoria. If, if that was the impression I gave. No, no, not you. That was, it, it, no, no, I, I agree with everything you said. Okay. So if I've given an impression different from that, then I apologize because that was not my intent. So if you're attending an event uh, in an official capacity because you're uh, opening the So I'm not sure perhaps the, the, the invitation comes, shows up on our email. Yeah. Uh, we don't even know who else is invited. Opening of or annual open house of Victoria Foundation. Please come. Four people may even come from downstairs, the, maybe forward by the mayor's office, and we get a lot of it. And, um, and of course, we as well as the ones from the Belfry, come and watch the free show. And so the question that went to you originally was with regard to the free show at the Belfry, and I actually agree with your advice that we should not go to the free show. But when it says, come and gather, meet our board, but it's, but I'm not being sent by council. Uh, council that doesn't even know, there's no official, the staff may not even know we got them. They show up on our emails or come in our mail slot. They're not vetted by anybody. So it says, come. I mean, of course I wouldn't get it if I wasn't on council. I'm only getting it because I'm on council. Um, and it's just not just a coincidence that everybody on council got it and, and only other board members and a few big donors. Of course we're going because we're on council and co of course we're not being sent by council. The question is, can we go and have the cookie? Yeah. And I think the answer is yes. <laughs> I, don't, I don't see that as, uh, I'm not sure that, I think perhaps I didn't previously understand the question, but I think that in the scenarios, uh, the three scenarios as, as described by Councillor uh, for Joe, I, I absolutely agree. If it's a, if you're fulfilling some kind of official function, you can go. If everybody else is going and paying, but you're not, simply because you're a councillor, you shouldn't go. And if you're attending an event like an open house, uh, to which not in the invitation is not sent out to the general public, but it is open to board members, you know, persons you know, in the community, so if active, you know, active in the community, and council members, I think you can go. And, and eat cookies. And, and eat cookies. And to add to that, for example, AGMs, if I go to, uh, say, ABI's AGM, they invite all the councillors, and no one has to pay at the AGM, that's fine. That's fine. If I go to the United Way AGM and everyone is paying $10 at the door, if I go, I pay $10 as, as to go. I don't, if they say, no, you don't have to pay, counselor. I go, no, everyone's paying $10. I will also pay my $10. So, 
So that's that sort of. But that, that's an important point, and, it, yeah. and it's your second example that I think is instructive because people invite us because Every it's good for them for us to be exposed to them. They're inviting us to influence us to help them in the future. So it's a benefit to the person who's inviting us, the organization who's inviting us. But if they're inviting us for that purpose, but we're not there to do anything, we're not going to speak or bring greetings or do anything at all, in my head, that's something that if there's a fee attached, I have to pay for as an individual. Mm -hmm. Because I'm not going as a counselor in the sense of I'm representing the council. I'm being invited because the people who are inviting me think that it would be helpful for me to be influenced by their position. It's a lobbying effort. So, so if there's a fee attached to that, and I think it's worthwhile, then I should pay for it because I'm making that decision. Mm -hmm. So that, so the Belfry tickets example is a great one. If the Belfry is inviting me because they're inviting counselors they think might be willing to be influenced to be supportive, and I want to go, then I'm going to buy my ticket. But if the Belfry is inviting me as acting mayor to go and open the show, and there's a fee attached to the tickets, and I have a role, then I'm not buying my ticket. Yeah. It, it, it sounds like you you have a, a sensible understanding of, of the purpose of these provisions. And in the case where you're, you're hung up, don't have the cookie. <laughs> well, it has to be a gift or benefit. I mean, right. a, a cookie is so it's intangible. Right. Except for edible things. Edible, edible things are exclusive. And, you know, the, the fact that you're going and meeting constituents, to me, that's, that's work. That's, that's what you right. do. Um, you probably see a benefit because at the end of the day, every three years, they have good no, but if, you're a, if, you're a, if you're having lunch somewhere and somebody buys your lunch, do you accept yeah, it? You know, no. you leave your money on the table? That's always paid. Always paid. Always paid. Yeah. You, you, really? Place, oh. It's interesting because I've had different experiences in the past when I wasn't elected. Who's wanting to influence you one way or the other on a particular subject, it's good practice to buy your own lunch. And coffee. I don't even do that. Yeah. I do my Anyways, own. mindful of the time. I know this is a, a topic of, of interest. Yeah. Yes, Not me. and it was always uncomfortable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So just a few concluding remarks. Um, conflict of interest provisions also prohibit the use of insider information to further your own pecuniary interests. In other words, if you know uh, the city's plans to acquire property and then you use that to go and buy up other property next door and that affects our interests, there are consequences for that. Um, you're required to disclose your pecuniary interest in a contract that you might be uh, have with the city uh, for one service or another. So if you have a contract with the city, you need to disclose that and file that with me. And uh, as Tom pointed out, it is the onus on yourselves to be aware of how your personal interests intersect with the public interest at the council table. Uh, severe uh, sanctions for uh, uh, behavior that is seen to be a conflict, um, unless you know it was uh, uh, your actions were done in good faith. You, you sought the advice, but the advice turned out to be wrong. You know things like that. So consequences are disqualification from office in many cases and or a court order to send her any financial gain obtained through the contravention of the provisions. Uh, Rob, th this is a question because you know, we've just come off an election. And of course with elections, there are groups that... I'm going to ask you to get you to ask that question when we get to the closed meeting okay. because it is, is very much a legal question. Okay. And I can't provide you an answer okay. to it. I, I, I've had that similar question asked. Rob has seven minutes to go through the next few okay. pages. Well, I'm, you know, it's going to take longer than that. So. I'm just... Okay, you have nine. <laughs> so, uh, there are some uh, proactive uh, responsibilities set out in our council bylaw. Those flow as well from the charter. Uh, powers and the duties of the mayor are noted in section five of the council bylaw. In summary, they're to provide leadership to the council communicate information to the council, preside at meetings whenever in attendance, to provide general direction to city officers respecting the implementation of municipal policies, programs, and other directions of the council, establish committees, suspend municipal officers and employees in accordance with section 151 of the charter, reflect the will of council and carry out other duties on behalf of the council, and to carry out the duties assigned by, the, by or under the community charter or any other act. So for example, the mayor carries out the duty of chair of the police board under the police act. 
is an example of that last one. Council members also have some responsibilities set out in Section 7 of the bylaw, generally to consider the well-being and interests of the city and the community, to contribute to the development and evaluation of the policies and programs of the city, to participate in council meetings, and that's that positive obligation, Councillor Gudgeon, that you have to weigh against perceptions about bias one way or the other, participate in council committee meetings and meetings of other bodies to which the member is appointed, carry out other duties assigned by council and other duties assigned by the charter or other acts. Now I'm going to turn my mind to some high level principles around financial management that are prescribed under the charter. In summary, uh, financial management principles include adopting a five-year financial plan. We'll be stepping through that process in the next month. Must not run an annual deficit in an operating budget year. We cannot borrow outside the prescribed limits set by provincial uh, regulation. We must obtain the assent of electors either through an alternative approval process or a referendum for capital liabilities that go beyond five years. We must conduct an annual audit. The city retains an external auditor for that purpose. And we may only expand reserves specific to the purpose of the reserve fund. So you must use the money in reserves funds for the definition uh, prescribed in the bylaw for that reserve fund. We've got a diverse set of revenue sources. One of the good things about being an urban municipality is we have a far more diverse set of revenues than a purely suburban or rural municipality. Ours include property taxes, local service taxes, utility fees, business licenses, uh, fees for other services, fines, and grants. Grants primarily flow from other levels of government. When we send out our property tax bill, only a portion of that property tax bill flows to the municipality. Uh, based on the last time I did this slide, uh, roughly 55% of the gross on the uh, tax bill comes to the municipality, 31% to the school district, 7 for the regional district, and three each for the hospital district and BC Transit. BC Assessment sets the property values annually. There's a process to appeal. Those appeals often extend beyond the current fiscal year. We often have our, our assessment base raised or reduced in subsequent years that have to make adjustments to the tax rolls for those respective years. Council sets the property tax and ratios. That process will wade into in February. We typically set the rates and ratios in April once many of the appeals have gone through the initial process and decisions have been made. We have the ability to exempt people from paying property taxes. We have to do that by bylaw. We do it for government and nonprofit owners, for eligible partnering, heritage and riparian properties, or within a designated revitalization area. And we talked about that a little earlier. Yeah, just a quick question now that Back up again. Are we able to adjust that way where there's a bit of a quid pro quo? Like if we give an exemption to a property, a non profit owner, our expectation is on the per, on the outside of their building is X, Y, and Z, or is that already in place? Like is there an expectation of whoever we give tax exemption to for them to maintain the building in a state that benefits the neighborhood that they're given tax the neighborhood that they reside in? certainly impose that as part of the condition of giving a tax exemption for certain things. I don't know generally about whether, you know, um, an exemption for Sandy Merriman House would come with the requirement <coughs> to keep it painted and Well, just not keep great. maintenance to a level. There's neighborhoods where there's, I, I think they get exemptions where they're in quite, they don't take care of the outside. Granted, they have other um, concerns that are primary, but it just seems, uh, are we able to create a policy that would, there would be a quid pro quo on being tax exempt, then they have to uh, keep it to a certain maintenance level on the exterior of the building that would benefit the neighborhood. Uh, tax exemptions, the, the, the permissive tax exemptions are within the discretion of council. So we could. So you certainly have a certain degree of, of leeway in terms of what you consider, or, or who do you consider to be worthy of receiving a tax exemption? Right. I'm not sure that you could technically uh, uh, tie it directly to the 
exemption in the sense that in the exemption uh, file or somehow provide for uh, attach a condition to the exemption. I don't think that that would be per permissible in itself, but you could certainly um, take into account uh, the impact that the activity has on the neighborhood uh, when you're making a decision on whether to grant the exemption okay. or not. Okay. Otherwise, the standards of maintenance of are applied to, to other mechanisms. The, the discussion of making the decision in the first place. Yeah, but I, and the reason I was uh, looking a little uh, um, confused because certainly the objective of many of the tax exemption for heritage buildings comes with the knowledge yes. that that building is being upgraded. So you would. Yeah, yeah. That's why I was going. I'm talking about more nonprofit. Yes, I understand. Has so a consultant been hired to? We're reviewing this tax policy. Is that right? Tax exemption. The heritage uh, policies are on the to-do list a long way out in terms of reviewing heritage matters. Right, but wasn't there a contract uh, put out for tender that it was to review something, something with related to the tax exemption status and permissive tax permissive policy. Yeah, um, that, that's that's coming out of sustainability and, and finance. Sure. Yeah. But, uh, so, but it relates, right? So is, that is happening now. Is that? Can anyone say? Uh, yeah. Sorry. We'll, we'll be coming up with a um, some suggestions uh, for council. I think on February 9th related mm -hmm. to permissive tax exemptions and, and the corporate uh, grant review. But um, we'll be focusing mostly on the grant side, and, and we'll be suggesting that the, uh, the tax side be dealt with uh, by finance subsequently. Okay. Okay. Um, in in giving exemptions for properties, the general principle is we have to publish a notice regarding the details of the exemption. We also have to report that in our annual report, the value of the the benefit being provided through the exemption, and generally speaking, the exemptions are limited to a 10-year period. With respect to expenditures, they can only be done in accordance with the five-year financial plan. You do have to adjust within a current operating budget year where your variances go beyond the uh, allowed amounts within each of the budgets. Uh, you cannot exceed revenues. You cannot run a deficit on an annual basis. And your five-year plan and your annual budget have to account for your debt servicing payments on the uh, debt that you carry from year to year. There's three types of borrowing. Uh, Short-term borrowing for capital purposes is any borrowing for less than five years. There is a set formula of borrowing room prescribed by uh, government regulation, provincial government regulation, and you can incur it for any type of capital debt. So those are for smaller projects that we might do, and then that's simply paid back through our, our, our operating budget debt servicing. Long-term borrowing, permitted for up to 30 years. Again, there's a formula based on the annual revenue that accrues to the city through property taxes. And we can only use long-term borrowing for specific purposes, those being of a capital nature, loans are guaranteed to others, court orders, a judgment against the city, an arbitration ruling, and paying compensation to another party. Assent is required where five years, uh, where the borrowings for greater than five years, and I've outlined to you the processes that can be used to get the assent of the electors. Finally, on an annual basis, we do revenue anticipation borrowing, so we don't raise our taxes to the middle of the year. For the first six months, we adopt a bylaw that, that allows us to uh, borrow 10 to 15 millions of dollars uh, to fund our operations until all our property tax revenue comes in uh, by July 1st. The revenue anticipation borrowing has to be repaid in the fiscal year it's borrowed, and it cannot exceed the amount of unpaid taxes and tax obligations to other local governments. So a lot of people do pay their taxes in advance of July 1st. We offer an interest rate, so when you see the revenue anticipation borrowing uh, by a lot, typically it's not, you'd, you'd be surprised at how small it is relative to our overall budget. These slides I'll go through quickly because <clears throat> depending on who's in the government, they either pay a lot of attention to this or they don't. 
but the community charter did prescribe principles for how the province is meant to behave in relation to its relations with local government municipalities. So there is a, lot, a legal obligation for the province to consult before they amend the charter, the Local Government Act, or the Local Government Grants Act. This is in relation to uh, grants from the province flow through the Local Government Grants Act, obviously reducing amounts as impacts on local governments. No one's going to argue about an increase, but I don't think we've seen that for some, some time. There is no mandatory consultation required prior to other effective forms of downloading. So the province decides to vacate a service area, uh, be it affordable housing or social service income supplements. Federal governments obviously doesn't apply in this case. It's not subject to the charter. Um, but there's other downloading that occurs for different reasons because provincial governments change their priorities. The province has taken a stand on municipal amalgamation and in the charter that says there will be no forced amalgamations that has to be done cooperatively between municipalities that wish to amalgamate. It does not apply to protective services. So that's why we saw the uh, police uh, amalgamation between uh, Victoria and Esquimalt and uh, would also apply I think to the uh, possibly to the fire services. Local Government Act is the other primary piece of legislation we have. I'm going to run through the main areas, focusing primarily on the uh, land development powers. So it preceded the Charter, and it represents the old approach to municipal legislation, which was very detailed and prescriptive. Here's what you can do, and here's how you do it. The Community Charter takes a different approach. Three significant areas in the, char in the Local Government Act are the Local Government Election Provisions. You're generally familiar with those, having just been through the election. <laughs> Planning and Land Use Management and Heritage Con Conservation. And the Local Government Act is the Regional District Legislation at this point in time. With respect to elections, I wasn't going to dwell much here. It prescribes the process of conducting elections and referendums, relates to the uh, rules around registration and qualifications for electors and for candidates, how candidates are nominated, and the subsequent reporting requirements for elected candidates, at, well, for all candidates uh, following the election. So I'll take this opportunity to remind everybody, March 15th or thereabouts is our filing deadline for your campaign financing disclosures. <laughs> yeah, everybody writes it down. <laughs> Planning and land use management, uh, Deb Day's area. I'm going to talk just at a very high level here. And uh, basically, there's a hierarchy of planning instruments in place in the Local Government Act. At the highest level, the most generalized level, is the regional growth strategy. This is a uh, bylaw adopted by the, the uh, capital regional district or the regional district in each area of the province. The highest level planning document in the municipal context is the official community plan, and we're going through the process of updating our community plan right now. Underneath is the zoning regulation bylaw, and then instruments that uh, fall out of both the OCP and the zoning regulation bylaw are development permits and development variance permits. The regional growth strategy is uh, a high level document. Purpose is to uh, promote human settlement that is socially, economically, and environmentally healthy and that makes efficient use of public facilities and services, land, and other resources. In the model in this region, it is a, a voluntary subscription model. It's based upon municipalities buying in and providing their regional context statements in their OCPs to stitch together a regional growth strategy and the official community plans. The official community plan is the highest level planning document for the municipality. It must have a statement of objectives and policies for planning and land use management must be consistent with the regional growth strategy. It delineates the location, type, amount, and density of different land uses at a very high level. And it also is the vehicle by which we establish development permit areas for different things. 
These include form and character of development, the protection of the natural environment, revitalization of commercial areas, and establishing objectives for energy and water conservation and reduction of greenhouse gases. That's a new requirement imposed, I think, through legislative amendment in 2008, and one of the reasons why uh, sustainability has an important role to play in the overall context of municipal planning. Deb, I think we've got DP areas for each of these things. Yes, we do. So when someone goes to build on a piece of property, if they're in an area of the city that's been designated as a development permit area, they have to meet certain uh, municipal requirements related to that construction and development. So the zoning bylaw divides the municipality up into zones, which may regulate the use of land and buildings the density of the use of the land and buildings on the land, the siting size and dimensions of buildings and uses, and the location of uses on the land or within buildings. So you can tell someone where that building has to be sited, and if you've got different types of uses, you can designate which areas on that, on that land the uses have to be uh, set in. How many different zones are there? Eight million? Yeah. <laughs> So a development permit is a specific thing issued by council. We did some development permits last night. In that case, they were development variance permits. Uh, but a development permit in a development permit area is required before land can be subdivided, before it can be built on, or before an alteration to a building or structure on the land is undertaken. And there's different objectives for different DP areas. I can't remember all the specific details, but. For example, in Old Town, one of the objectives is the preservation of the heritage fabric of Old Town as an objective of the DP area. And new construction, I think, has to be sympathetic to the sort of form and character of the Old Town, Deb, generally speaking. Yes, um, when we bring forward the OCP, we'll have a much more extensive discussion because we actually have created a complex um, overlaying of development permit areas and heritage conservation areas. So this. Uh, We'll have a lot more detail about this because it's not necessarily as straightforward as that. And there also <coughs> are exemptions that the development permit area is set out. So <coughs> a very complex area that we'll spend a lot more time on when that comes forward. But this gives you a broad brush of general approach. Development variance permit allows for minor variations to the zoning bylaw. Uh, but they can't, that type of permit cannot alter the use or density of land. <coughs> Floodplains aren't really an issue in Victoria, although there are a couple areas that are low-lying and get flooded once in a while, uh, or a phased, <laughs> phased development agreement. Uh, most often we see a development variance permit in relation to uh, varying the parking requirements uh, under the zoning bylaw, or the setbacks of a building from the lot lines. Those are the most frequent examples here. Heritage conservation is another important part of the Local Government Act, especially in Victoria, because we are an old city. The, the provisions provide the authority to inspect property to determine its heritage significance, to establish a heritage registry, to enact temporary protection of heritage properties, and to enact ongoing protection of heritage properties by bylaw. We have a very active heritage program here at the city, and we do all of these things. Heritage, uh, the uh, Act provides the authority to uh, delegate, uh, delegate heritage value analysis to a commission. In this case, we've got uh, an organization who assists us with residential and commercial heritage evaluations. That's the Heritage Foundation and the Heritage Trust. We have the authority to prevent the demolition or alteration of property that is, is uh, where a heritage value has been determined. We control the alteration of property through a heritage alteration permit or revitalization agreement. And we can exempt the payment of property taxes to achieve heritage revitalization objectives. Our example in our community is the TIPS program uh, administered through Planning and Development Department. We must demonstrate that there is heritage value in a property, so typically we would commission and expert to go in and identify what those values are. 
In some cases, we use city staff for that purpose. And where a heritage designation bylaw affects the market value of a property, and we enact that bylaw against an unwilling property owner, we must pay compensation for the loss of value that relates to the, the uh, heritage designation. And we've been through that exercise on several occasions, and it is something you have to keep in mind where um, uh, we are designating a property without the heritage property owner's consent. As a result, the majority of our her heritage designations are voluntary, and we've got incentives in place to encourage people to subscribe to that, bring their properties forward for designation. Funding is, uh, the grants are distributed through the two organizations that help us with the residential and commercial heritage evaluations. Just some other considerations in respect to the legislation. They're obviously subject to judicial interpretation. There's a whole career's worth of interpretation of law that we uh, rely on when we seek advice from lawyers in this area. And many of our proceedings that we undertake are subject to other legal principles, such as principles related to administrative law and natural justice, where we hold hearings is an example. And if you think it's complicated trying to remember what two pieces of legislation require us to do, there's a very long list of other statutes that interact with our municipal authorities in which we have a role or an obligation to do a number of things. And these are part of the list. There we go, the local government grants act system. Now I'm going to move into the conduct of council business. Um, one of the areas that I know that uh, council has an interest in uh, webcasting and web streaming, and we will need to spend time on uh, council procedure bylaw, making sure everybody has a good understanding of the procedural elements of conducting business, uh, because when we're live on camera, we want to get it right the first time. There's no second date on live TV. <laughs> Council bylaw sets out your meeting procedures. It's uh, esoteric, but uh, I'm going to capture some of the high points just as we go through here. And the purpose of those procedures are not to frustrate, but to facilitate your business, to move you through thoughtful deliberation and also timely decision making. It does provide for transparency in the conduct of your business. This relates to making sure that there's notice provided for meetings, that the meetings are held in open session, except where they may be closed by the legislation or the bylaw. Provides rules for indivi individual conduct, mostly around debate and uh, what's permitted in debate and making motions and things like that. Does apply to all committees of council. And the mayor or the chair of the meeting is the person who rules on points of order. Where the council disagrees with the ruling of the chair or the mayor, there is a process to resolve that, and it involves putting a motion, and that's set out in the bylaw as well. Generally speaking, meetings must be open to the public, unless closed for a specified reason. We need to publish a regular meeting schedule, which we do. We maintain that as well as on our website. When we want to have a special meeting, we may do that, but we must give notice. The mayor has the authority to convene a special meeting. Typically, he instructs me to prepare the notice. I sign the notice. It's published and distributed out. Any two councillors can request a special meeting. They do that in writing to the mayor. The mayor must consider their request and set a meeting date. I believe it's within seven days of the request. If the mayor fails to do that, the two councillors can come to me and instruct me in writing to convene a special meeting. Well, yeah. Can you remind me of the, um, so for example, if uh, somebody wants to meet uh, to discuss something, and that there's only a certain amount of counselors that can convene. Can um, yeah, I, I will is touch that, on that. that. Just let me uh, okay, that is finish this sure. particular thought off. Okay. Um, in an emergency, council may convene a meeting without notice. 
it has to be done by unanimous consent of all members of council. So if there was an emergency and there were only eight of you present, we couldn't convene a meeting without notice. Obviously, the reason for that is you can't pull a fast one on the one councillor who's not there. So you can't disadvantage them by calling a meeting and making a decision uh, without notice. So the privilege goes to everyone to be advised of when that meeting is. Um, the issue around what constitutes a council meeting, um, Tom might provide more fine level of detail, but generally speaking, where the council members assemble, and there's more than a, uh, uh, and there's a plenum, more than five there, and their purpose is to conduct council business. I mean, we w that, w that would appear to be a council meeting. Is that a lawfully convened council meeting? No. Would any of the decisions that you make in that meeting uh, be binding? The answer to me would be no. So you can get together, but it's not a council meeting unless it's properly convened. And we wouldn't recommend you, we wouldn't recommend the practice of assembling together to appear to conduct council business without the proper rules applying, which means the meeting must be properly convened, notice must be given, it must be held in public, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Otherwise, you would be making a representation to someone that could be potentially problematic both for the corporation and for you individually. Tom wants to, yeah, Tom's I, I shouting at me here. There is, I mean, there's a lot of actually gray and ambiguity in, uh, around the very simple question of what is a council meeting. So I, I don't have a quick answer, but I think I want to add to to the caution that uh, Rob just uh, gave you that the idea of council members meeting um, uh, outside of a properly constituted meeting to conduct or to discuss city business or move the city business along its process of deliberations, along the process of decision making is highly problematic uh, and it could invalidate the ultimate decision. In other words, it, uh, it is not an option for you to meet over coffee to discuss some city business and then come to a property constituted council meeting and vote on it. But I could invite everyone for lunch with no agenda and go, hi, your name is, how are you today? We're not talking about any city business. Is that improper? No. If oh, you're not talking okay. about city business, I'm talking about discussing right. uh, discussing city business uh, or, or moving it along the decision-making process. So right, whether it's to receive information from staff or from others uh, or to discuss it among yourselves, that should be done. Uh, in a properly constituted meeting. Now, that doesn't mean you can't individually talk to your colleagues. Uh, obviously, you can. But if you're all going to meet with a decision, with right, an intention of moving meeting. it along the decision-making process, it's a council yeah, meeting and it should sense. go through that those requirements and, in particular, public you know, notice. It's sort of common sense. Horror yeah. story from another municipality. The council gets together, the entire council gets together prior to a public hearing discusses how they're going to yeah, vote no, right. and agrees that that's how they're going to vote. They go to the public hearing, you know, sit and listen to all the people, and then, of yeah, course, that's vote. wrong. It's common that's sense, right. right? So it's that's common what sense? That's <laughs> fixing the deal behind yeah. the closed but, doors. But just going out to have a picnic or uh, I think yeah, you'd be surprised by the number of just, cases. Just to continue that, uh, yeah. so my Where understanding in the past, and I'll give examples to, to make it clear, uh, say somebody wants to meet uh, to discuss their development, mm -hmm. to give a better idea. And they invite council members to come. My understanding was, so if we all say, Chris says, yeah, I'll go, and Marianne says, yeah, I'll go, and we say, oh, well, these are the dates that we can, that we'll open it up to. My understanding in the past is that as long as there isn't enough to make quorum, so once, so there have been times where, mm -hmm. you know, there'll be five, and I'll, and I'll get it, and someone will say, Charlene, since you were the last to say, confirm, maybe you can book on the next date because we can't have quorum there. Or for example, I, I don't know, maybe that's just the best example yeah, to use. That's yeah. that's so that's, that's my idea. understanding in the past. Another one was the Dogwood Initiative. I think uh, they wanted to meet with us to talk about some issue. And we had to see how many counselors were gonna be going because once we got to five, we would, we, you know, get to commit. So I, I wanna make sure I'm clear on that. 
That's been the understanding. And I think the difficulty is you can all get together for lunch, but then someone says, so what do you think about the Gonzales pathway? Well, you know, and all of a sudden you're in it, yeah. right? And that's that's the difficulty. Or there's but five. Really of you. We all know no. that that's a difficulty. Could we well, get a response to yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, I thought Charlie's she was just saying it's true. Very specific, and I'd okay. like to hear a response on it. Sorry, I, I think uh, I'm not sure I fully understood the question, but my my comment would be this: you can't get around. I mean, there are all kinds of other cautions about uh, attending meetings with. Uh, developers, applicants, and, and whether it's five of you or four of you or one of you, there are all kinds of cautions that have nothing to do with whether this is a council meeting or not. It's a question of, of procedural fairness and, and transparency of the process, uh, dangers of apprehension of bias, etc. and I'll be covering some of those uh, uh, later today. In terms of this discussion of what constitutes a meeting, if you get together, whether it's in this room or next uh, door or over a coffee somewhere. And it doesn't really matter whether it's all of you or five of you or four of you, for the purpose of, of advancing a, an item that's on council agenda along the decision-making process that could be considered a council meeting. And I'm sorry if I'm not being clear, but unfortunately, the case law that's out there does not offer any further guidance than that. The other context where this has often come up is at one time the municipalities were experimenting in having workshops. They were looking for a less formal setting to talk with the council in a closed meeting where everyone was excluded, but the topic didn't necessarily qualify under the closed meeting topic. So municipalities of Ontario started having these having work council workshops. Uh, I know we dabbled in it here 10 or 12 years ago, and it doesn't matter whether you call it a workshop or a council meeting or a committee of the whole meeting. If we convene you all here for the purpose of meeting to advance or discuss city business, it's a council meeting and all the rules apply. So that's the one we've dealt with most frequently here is this business around workshop. A workshop is whenever the council gathers to discuss city business in city hall or the city meeting room or another meeting room that I've identified to come and meet it, the rules apply to it. My question is, does, does this explicitly uh, prohibit uh, municipal parties? I mean, in Vancouver, you have municipal parties, and we've had uh, groups of people running in other municipalities, but from the way you describe it, they are explicitly prohibited there's a majority, if they represent a, mm -hmm. representing a majority of council, from getting together and discussing their program. I wouldn't say they're explicitly prohibited. I think that the practice of meeting in caucus uh, where there is a majority may be very much problematic. Uh, because, as I said, there have been a number of cases uh, uh, across the country on this issue. Uh, believe it or not, it, it, it hasn't been resolved what constitutes a council meeting. Uh, there certainly are decisions, uh, not from British Columbia, but from other jurisdictions, which very clearly state that whether something is a council meeting or not it is not dependent on the sort of trappings of the, of the meeting. It doesn't have to be a council chamber, there doesn't have to be an agenda, there doesn't have to be a clerk taking notes. It could still be a council meeting. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily say what is a council meeting. It just it, so it, these decisions are always made on, on uh, sort of specific facts, and, and sometimes it's difficult to extrapolate a, a nice, clean, general statement. Uh, but it's very clear that uh, what uh, Rob was referring to, the workshops that, that a lot of municipalities, I think, in British Columbia used to engage in, um, were a lot easier to do prior to community charter and the explicit requirement for open meetings uh, and, and uh, limits on closed meetings. Um, I think that any time you have a controversial matter, uh, the, I would caution you against uh, uh, getting together to find out information, to receive information from staff, which is what workshops used to be, unless you do it in a properly constituted meeting. And, and the rules are there to benefit all from the council. 
in making your decisions, you should all be entitled to get the same amount of information that everyone else at the table gets. Maybe. So that's part of the process of funneling you into a formal decision-making mechanism that we call GPC or Standing Committee or Council so that you get all the same information, you hear the same people, whether they're the applicant or the public, and you make your decision based upon the same information. No one has an advantage over others. There is also increased over the last uh, uh, years uh, the emphasis on open government in terms of transparency and openness, and the courts have been far stricter in interpretation of rules related to procedures around uh, local government meetings and conduct of business with the recognition of the sort of requirement, implicit requirement of transparency, uh, if not explicitly stated in legislation. Two questions that raise it. So one is, and it's a little bit further on Jess, say three or four of us say, uh, let's get together and a little coffee and let's figure out how we can get a um, regional housing levy going, right? So, you know, Marianne, I know you're interested in that. Charlene, I know you're interested in that. Lisa, I know you're interested Let's get together and talk about that. Am I just blowing the, you know what I mean? Because I'm planning on how to move that forward, and I'm strategizing with my colleagues on that. Is there that's, any case law on that? Is that CRD business, though? Uh, <laughs> I'm looking for an easy out. I was looking, I was being deliberately <laughs> doing the CRD thing. This is, well, I mean, the, you know, I, I think where, where this is particularly important uh, is uh, in a context uh, where you're dealing with uh, a, a, a rezoning development application, uh, issues of that nature, uh, where, where rules of procedural fairness apply. Uh, it, I think it is, I, I don't think that uh, the courts would be particularly, uh, uh, would find it particularly problematic if council members met to brainstorm uh, over broader policy decisions or directions or actions of, of, of the council may want to contemplate down the road versus where you are sitting in a decision-making role where you're adjudicating effectively on somebody's uh, rezoning application or, or development permit application. Those are usually the, the cases that have been, uh, uh, that I've seen, that's the context in which these things arise is where, where there's a development permit, for example, denied and there turns out were discussions with staff or, or uh, in behind closed doors, not in a properly constituted meeting. That's when you get to start getting in trouble. Slightly similar, but somewhat different. But uh, an example where perhaps uh, three, four, five of Victoria Council ends up on the leadership council for the homelessness, and we're talking about advancing a specific. Um, housing project that may even be in the city of Victoria. Now where there is a role as either appointed by the city or appointed by the CRD, but there's four or five of us and we're saying, you know, I'm just, I don't want someone to come say, you decided there that this was a good thing. Mm -hmm. I know this goes back to which hat you're wearing, but. I, I think this goes more to the question of, of bias and, and uh, uh, prejudging issues then to a question of whether this is a meeting. I, I don't think that okay. simply because the five yeah. council members are present in a different capacity together, that yeah. does yeah. not make it for a council yeah. meeting. We may, not be, we may skip the, this rule, but we may blow the administrative fairness rule. Okay, thanks. Doesn't intent come into it a little bit? Like if you, if you, if the mayor, mayor Fortin, if you wanted to talk about something and you invited all of the councillors and only four or five could make it, that seems to me to be a different, because your intention is to discuss something amongst your, your fellow, your, your team, so to speak, as opposed to you picking ones without being transparent in your willingness to engage everyone in the discussion. But it would still be a meeting. Yeah, I'd probably have to yeah. get a notice. Yeah, because the, his intention doesn't affect whether or not it's a meeting. If he invites the whole council but only four of us show up, you've now got a quorum of picks mm -hmm. on a particular issue. I'm sorry, he was saying earlier, though, that if you just got counts with uh, Councillor Morton well, Joe, Marianne Alto, and you, you, you know, you, at least it helps, so you just pick that it, for you to say, let's get together to discuss this issue. 
that to me, the intention is to split off the, the conversation from the entire council table. That to me would be problematic rather than yeah, inviting everybody and in whoever. I'm just trying to make common sense it's of it. If I just going to meet with coffee and talk about that, I may be setting it up. Uh, a different said, if I want to talk to everybody, then we can actually do the formal note. It's more about giving notice and hanging out. But the important yeah. part of it is just it only would be a meeting if it is moving the item along its decision sort of path. So I, I don't want to say you can't ever talk with each other about city business unless it's in a meeting, because that's definitely not the case. It's more of a question if you're in a group where you're, you're, you're actually making a decision of some sort, where you're sort of saying, okay, let's do it this way, or let's not consider this, or let's have staff report on that, or let's ask for that, or some some kind of movement so that after the meeting the matter has now progressed mm -hmm. yes. somewhere exactly. there is some direction even if it's not in a formal sense there is a direction there is a decision or in indication of a decision or leaning towards something that's what that's problematic. what's problematic if you're simply Good. brainstorming about issues or discussing issues among yourselves you're certainly entitled to do that great and part of this i think is to do with um, your openness at a public at a public hearing. Yes. You fair, mean remaining open to what we hear there? Yeah. yeah. Yes. And fairness to all the members of council. Absolutely. And, and the underlying mm. uh, assumption uh, that that underlies all these rules is transparency and openness of, of local government. And fairness. And and fairness. So a standing committee finishes their deliberations, sends something forward to GPC or to council, which we'll all be dealing with. Meeting finishes, they go for lunch and say, hmm, when this comes up, what do you think? Mm -hmm. How's it going to, I mean, that's, hmm? That would be, you know. I, I wouldn't do that. I think you got to keep yeah. it separate. Yeah. Like, that's just common sense. You don't want to discuss it further on what, you, uh, sorry. But, but See I'll the finish line, <laughs> and then I'm going to hand you over to Tom. After we have a short Because I'm dancing, because I'm going to use the bathroom. <laughs> so you look like Steve for Blue's Blues there. That was really good. Sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> trying to focus you. Steve. Uh, <laughs> I don't have children. So. so, those are all great uh, questions, and I think Tom might be able to add a little more, um, but I just want to get this part done. <laughs> so, decision making. This relates to our topic that we were just discussing, because council must act by bylaw or resolution. It can only act by bylaw or resolution. A bylaw we're familiar with, a resolution is simply a motion that's passed by council. Uh, procedures must be followed to ensure a valid decision, and different procedural requirements apply in different circumstances. Council, though, has the final authority, unless that authority is delegated to a committee of council. So the private property maintenance committee, or the planning and land use standing committee, has authority to place notices on title. That's a delegated authority. City administration, council has by bylaw delegated to myself and the mayor to be the signatories to agreements that are authorized by council. Um, or there's delegated authority to other bodies, and the board of variance is one that came to mind. The board of variance is a statutory creature under the local government act. They have authority that is discreet from council, and council cannot intrude in the affairs of the Board of Variants other than in the appointment of the members of the Board of Variants. If we, never mind. We can't, don't go there. <laughs> Decisions arise from different roles you play. Tom disagrees with me to some extent, so I dumbed this down a bit, but. <laughs> <laughs> council. Oh, so now we agree so with now you. We agree. <laughs> so now we agree with <laughs> you. <laughs> Council plays an executive role. It makes decisions. So the mayor doesn't have any authority to make a decision that's binding on the corporation. Only the council does. By passing a motion, you make an executive decision. You instruct staff or a person outside of the organization that they must do something. You have a legislative role. You adopt bylaws that regulate different things in our community. You also have an adjudication role. So you go through a process of hearing the public interest on a matter before you adopt a bylaw, like a zoning regulation bylaw or an OCP bylaw, or you pass a resolution relating to a taxi permit or a business license. 
for a um, remedial action requirement. So there are very specific procedural rules and legal precedents that govern each of these particular processes. In passing resolutions, I'm just talking about the real fine level of detail right now, getting into the procedure bylaw. Primary motion has to be put onto the floor. At council, it has to be seconded. In committee, it does not. You then have a deliberation opportunity once there's something before you, a decision that's being discussed, and that deliberation is guided by the council bylaw. So there's some rules in the council bylaw about how many times people can speak to a matter, and if they're going to speak a second time, they've got to add new information, some discretion on the council to hear that. When a motion is put and a council member wishes it to be divided into parts, because maybe it's a five-part motion, you agree with three of the parts and don't agree with two of the parts and you want to amend them, it's fair to, as a single council member can ask that the question be divided. Once a motion is on the floor, you may move subsidiary motions. You may move to amend the motion that is on the floor, or you may re move to refer that motion to a committee of council, for example. How did, you know, after discussing it for a while, you realize, ah, this thing isn't really fully baked. We're going to send it back to the Environment and Infrastructure Committee and get them to address the, these things. We're going to refer it back to staff to report on these <coughs> things. Technically speaking, these two, uh, amending and referring, they may be debated and amended. So you can amend an amendment. We don't like to get beyond two amendments to an amendment that gets too confusing. And you can amend a, a motion to refer. A motion to table is, is, is really applies to pausing something within a meeting. So if you make a motion to table, you should be thinking, we're going to deal with this tonight. If your intention is not to deal with it tonight, but to deal with it on another time, or sorry, another date, a motion to postpone consideration is the one you want to look for. At any time through all of this, a motion for the previous question, which is the main motion or the first amendment, can be made as well. In other words, I've had it with this debate. This is going nowhere. I call the previous question. Someone seconds it at council. You then have to deal with the previous question. You discard. You have to vote on whether you're going to deal with the previous question. You call for the previous question. Oh no, you don't vote on it. It's, I move the previous question. If you seconded me, then we are abandoning whatever it was we were discussing. And no, okay, we're putting that question on the floor for the oh for, for the debate. Yeah. If it's adopted, then you, and then call you go the question on the floor. Yeah. Technically speaking, those motions aren't to be debated or amended, and it's just one of those process efficiency rules. You know, if you tabled it or not, <coughs> or it or not, you so shouldn't be debating. It should really be, I move to table, someone says, second. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Yes. There's no, no Everybody wants to try to convince you of why you should support their tabling motion. Can't be done. That is there's, no, there's no debate, but there's a vote. Yes. yes. Yeah. No, but, but there's always a debate. Yeah. I mean, there shouldn't be, but there always is. Yeah. Okay. Can Thank you. Can you not even debate whether the question should be called? Our bylaw says... No debate. Tabling, at all. postponing, and motion for previous question. No debate. <coughs> no debate. Okay. If you want to change your bylaw, you certainly may. That's how it reads today. Okay. Uh, a, and a, a, a <coughs> resolution or a bylaw may be reconsidered subject to time limits. <coughs> so a motion to reconsider can be made within a meeting by any member of council. A motion to reconsider can be put at the next scheduled meeting, regular meeting, and that's it for a member of council. The mayor has the authority to bring back a matter for reconsideration within 30 days, and his authority is distinct from the council's authority. When the mayor brings a matter back for reconsideration, he simply uses his authority and says, you will reconsider this vote, and that matter is now before you again. Council must propose a motion, must be seconded, and the motion to reconsider must pass. If that happens, 
then that matters before you again. A motion can be rescinded by a member who voted in favor. The reason that rule is in place is that if something passed in the first place, there's no point going over rolled ground unless someone has changed their mind. So the, the notion that someone who voted in favor has to propose a motion to rescind means that there's a change in the, you know, the balance of power that passed that particular motion in the first place. Time limits for rescinding? No time limits for rescinding. In both cases, there may be consequences that flow from taking these actions because the city may have entered into a contract, someone may have gotten a permit and started building a building. You have to seek the advice as to what the consequences are. In many cases, there may not be any consequences. Passing bylaws, there's a more formal process for passing bylaws. Bylaws have to be posted at least 24 hours before being introduced for the first time in a council meeting. A readings must be given in an open meeting of council. A bylaw may be given three readings at once at one meeting and then may be adopted at a sub subsequent meeting, providing there's at least a 24-hour break between the time it was given third reading and the time it was adopted. Many bylaws require public input. Uh, rezoning and OCP and development type bylaws all require public hearings. You can waive a public hearing for certain types of development bylaws. We typically don't. Hearings are, are generally involved uh, either a written submission in the case of uh, many of the business regulation initiatives we do, or a public hearing where the public's invited to come and speak or submit written correspondence. There's special cases in relation to OCP and zoning bylaw amendments and heritage designation bylaws. Those bylaws are given two readings at one meeting, a hearing is held, and then the council can give the final two readings on the night that it holds the hearing or any day afterwards. That's it for me. Thank you. Thanks, and that's just sort of scratching the surface, so <laughs> the door is always open. And I'll turn it over to Tom. Let us have a two-minute recess, recognizing that we, some of us are probably going to.